Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 225. Today, we are so excited. We finally have a guest back on the show and someone who I have been itching to talk to for a long time, Benita Alexander. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. Really yeah. great to be here. Really Absolutely. great to meet you. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's like I said, so awesome to meet you and very surreal because I've been, you know, into your story for quite some yeah. time now and I've seen so many interviews with you and to just be sitting with you in person <laughs> is is really cool. So if you've not heard Benita's story, this is so mind-blowing, you guys. You're going to be like I said just totally blown away by this. When I first heard your story after Kendall had recorded a video on it, I was just mm -hmm. kind of like, how is this even real? Because it mm -hmm. only seems like something that would be possible in a movie, a movie script or something like yeah. that. But the fact that this is real actually life, real. actually happened to you and there's this man who we'll get into uh, that's out there and um, he's a surgeon doing some, what many would say is experimental surgery. I mean, it's just, it's absolutely, insane that it is we're you know talking about this in in real life so yeah yeah your story with him alone is just so intense and then when you go beyond that i know it's just like an mind-boggling the layers yeah. that this guy had going for so long and so many people i mean there are many victims here to discuss and we're just so happy that you're here to you know share your story i know you've Thank told you. it so many times and that can't be easy um, but it's so important, I think, for people to hear this and yeah. to hear what people are capable of. Exactly. And that's what we were just discussing before this is, you know, it makes you start to question everyone, especially people like doctors. This guy was a doctor performing these crazy surgeries. Yeah. Groundbreaking surgery. And it was all based on lies. Lies. Yeah. Yeah. It really does make you question everybody that you come in contact with especially professionals. So we will get into all of the details here. There's a lot that you guys are going to, I just know there'll be so many I questions. Know. And so, yeah, which, I'm just so glad we have you in here to tell <laughs> us exactly. Which just, I want to give just for those before we get into, I mean, we have a lot of, of ground to cover just to sort of make all this make sense, but you've called him a pathological con man. Is that the best way to, describe yeah i mean at a, at a minimum he's a pathological yeah. liar at a, at at a, a minimum. minimum right right i mean i'm not a professional so i can't diagnose him right. i think he's also a sociopath of say. some kind you know yeah. megalomaniac many other things um but at a minimum he is a yes. extreme pathological liar who unfortunately caused so much damage to so many people yeah. and people probably died because of him and that's that's mm -hmm. the really scary part about it he's dangerous he is dangerous. And he's not behind bars as exactly. of right now, which is, which when you hear about the things that happen and mm -hmm. uh, the outcomes of the surgeries that he's done, it, it will blow your mind that there hasn't been, you know, any More repercussions. jail time given yeah. Yeah. due to how these surgeries have gone and yep. patients have died. And, and then obviously just all the things that you've gone through with him and, it's just yeah how is he still getting away with this it, yeah it's crazy it's crazy so you also have a podcast that you've recently started kind of over the summer earlier yeah. this year Benita and the Baracas which I'm not I'm actually not saying the word right um it's this beautiful Colombian word which stands for a strong woman who's been through something really difficult yeah but, um is still standing strong and fighting back and has overcome and when I discovered this word, and I was in Colombia on vacation, and there was a restaurant with this name. It was run by all women, and I just fell in love with the word because it really sort of, to me, captures everything that I've been through and that a lot of women go through. That, you yeah. know, you you go through something really traumatic, really difficult that should knock you down and is almost impossible to get back up off the ground. But you, you know, you peel yourself back up and you keep going, and that gives you a kind of strength that hard to yeah. describe, really, and that's yeah. what a baraka is. A really strong. I like that. That's uh, yeah, yeah, like it's, unbreakable. Yeah, a really strong woman, and it's also about empowering other women. Yeah, you know, and not Baraka's work together. You know, and so I love that. you have a support system. And, yes, yeah. which is so important. You know, to not mm -hmm. point the finger at other women and to really embrace each other and support each other, and that's very much part of my whole platform now. Yeah. And so the po in the podcast, I retell my story in sort of a encapsulated form, and then I've started telling other women's stories because so many women 
Yeah. Unfortunately, this happens to a lot of women. Maybe not as extreme as my crazy case, which we'll hear, but a lot of women get conned by someone that they loved yeah. and trusted. And they're all coming to me now wanting to tell their stories. And um, there needs to be a place to expose these people. And I think most importantly, to help other women know that if this happens to you, you're not alone. Yeah. You know, and above all, you're not stupid, you know? Yeah. Yes. I mean, there's so much shame attached to being duped or conned. Mm-hmm. And the tendency is to want to hide under the you know, under the bed and not talk about it, but we need to talk about it. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't, if we don't talk about it, this perpetuates. This doesn't yes, stop. Exactly. So. Yeah. The more education that can be out there for yeah. other people that could fall victim to something like this. Well, and just breaking the stigma of like shaming. A victim shaming. For, yeah. You know, well, how are you so dumb that you'd fall for this? And it's terrible. It's, people are so awful, especially on the internet. I mean, I've seen people, I've seen victims who have passed being shamed even after their death commenters they should have known better it's just so sad i mean um so it's brave to get out there and tell your story and help other women do the same so yeah that will be all linked below you guys should definitely check it out is there a way that people can contact you if they have a story or want to connect yeah with you about something the best place through? is to go to either instagram or tiktok and it's okay. anita alexander underscore official and then in the link tree you know there's links to my website and a contact page where if you have a story and you we can, can throw you your can link tree it. uh throw right. your link yeah. tree yeah. here in our our subscription box and, yeah. and show notes and stuff so people can check it out because that, that's what i was going to say too is like we're we're going to do a deep dive on this but there's also tons of media coverage nice. and yeah. mm-hmm. documentaries and and we'll we'll try to link as, as much of that uh below as well just because i think it's all because like obviously we're not gonna be able to show everything that's yeah, in, in the documentary yeah. and there's just so much information like we we want you to be able to tell your story the way you want it to be told and and that's why we love bringing people on is because we are just kind of secondhand getting this mm-hmm. information from other people reporters documentaries things like right. that but it's it's a whole different level to actually bring yeah. the, the the victim yeah. or the person in and allow them to tell their own to, story yeah tell their yeah. own story it's like you know, we we do our best to tell other people's stories for a living, but it's like it's best from the the person who actually went through it and lived yeah. through these things. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, we're just super grateful that you're here and excited Thank too that Thank you. we're going to dive into this. So, yeah, I think let's just kind of start with an overview of who you are and like just personally, you know, maybe if you want to give us a little bit about you know where you came from, your backgrounds, and and specifically leading into you're a journalist and how you got into journalism because that is such a key uh, part of this whole whole story. So Yeah, I'm a journalist. Um, I started out in um, print and always thought I would go into print and then got into radio and TV and ultimately ended up in TV. And um, my ex-husband i met him in tv he was tv reporter and i we were both working in local television in michigan at the time and i was working on the assignment desk which is kind of like the traffic controller of the newsroom and he was on air he was a reporter and we fell in love and we got married in detroit michigan and then we he's from new york so we moved to new york and after we moved to new york my daughter our daughter born in (laughs) new york and i started working um, for NBC, for Dateline NBC at the network, um, which was great and was kind of like my dream job. Um, so he was working as a local reporter for NBC, the local news um, mm-hmm. in New York, and I was working for the network. So we were both working at 30 Rockefeller in New York. Oh, wow. 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 It was it was very exciting. Power and, couple. Yeah, and we both loved our jobs. I love my job, and um, I got to work on a lot of really exciting things that sort of run the gamut from investigative to celebrity stuff, did a lot of traveling, um, won a ton of awards. And um, yeah, it was a really amazing an job. An Emmy, you've won an Emmy what, yeah, twice? Yeah, a couple yeah. Emmys, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was yeah. nominated for a bunch of Emmys too. You say it so casually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's uh, no, amazing. Big, no big deal. I no. feel like because a lot of people in my business, there are people in my business have like 12, 15 Emmys. So it's, oh. you know, when you're in the business, it's, it doesn't seem like that big of a deal. Although I have one, I'm not even sure where the others are, but I have one Emmy that I keep in my bedroom and Anytime I have a party or anything, people come in and they're like, oh, my God. It's yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> that's I would heavy. Be, you know, and they want to pick it up. And uh, I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's, um, that's really cool. Did you always know you wanted to be a journalist? Was that something like, like, at what point did you decide, I want to go into journalism? And uh, have you always been interested in, like, these types of stories and crime and things like that? Was that something that was 
a prior interest of yours or that just kind of I always loved to write ever since I was very little um I can remember entering poetry contests when I was really young and then when I was I think I was eight and I'm from Australia I was born in Australia my oh very cool uh, my uncle came to visit my mom's brother and he's a journalist uh, was a journalist he worked for radio for Europe and he had this very interesting you know intriguing job and he came and I was just fascinated and he was telling us all these stories and when he left I said to my parents I said that's what I want to do and you know, I was eight, you know, and, and they're like, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah. <laughs> my family calls me Ben. They're like, okay, Ben, sure. But, you know, I did. I never changed my mind. And once I started working in the business, and I, especially when I became successful and started winning awards and stuff, he was just so tickled by that um, and loved that I did it, you know. Uncle Rolly. So it was because of Uncle Rolly, who actually recently passed away. So oh, um, I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. But he, um, yeah, I, he's the reason I got into journalism and I'm, and I loved it. So you're working in New York, which you still reside in New York City yep. today. Mm-hmm. Are you in like in the city at Manhattan? In Brooklyn. In Brooklyn. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. I, I have family in Manhattan. And I just, I mean, for being from Colorado and stuff, when you go to New York, you're just like, whoa, the concrete <laughs> jungle, you know, yeah. it's, it's a totally different experience. And, oh, yeah, you and, have to count. Uh, yeah, no, I, I know. Mean, you got to go. Everyone's like, how have you not been? Well, it's like when I come here, though, and see the mountains. I'm like, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> There's mountains. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know yeah, walking around on, you know, on the streets and you're just looking up and it's just skyscrapers all Everywhere, around Everywhere, I know. It's oh. it's kind of versus like out here, it's wide open and you're yeah, seeing the mountains yeah. and stuff. It's kind of a... And it's, it's a lot of people condensed into a small space. It's very high energy. It yeah, is. Yeah, it is yeah. very high energy. Yeah, I think that's that was the thing that kind of blew me away was just how fast everything yeah. is. People are just moving quickly yeah. past you like nobody's just like yeah, it's casually, not for like, everybody yeah actually, you know? i would fall apart <laughs> my anxiety would be raging i can't even imagine even going to downtown denver for me is like a a big thing <laughs> it's it's it, yeah it's like overwhelming yeah. sometimes okay so you and your husband eventually got divorced um so that was 2009 mm-hmm. okay and it's you guys remained pretty friendly to some degree in co-parenting yeah, we you know i mean I don't think any divorce or very few divorces are pretty. It was a yeah. it was a contentious divorce. Um, it was a difficult divorce, but we were both committed to keeping things at least cordial and amicable, amicable for our daughter. We both absolutely adore our da- daughter, and we were very committed to that. And so, in that sense, we never allowed any of the other stuff to interfere with that. And so, you know, we were very fluid with um, her going back and forth. We never even stuck to whatever. I can't remember what the court agreement said, but it was just whatever she wanted to do. She was with me, she was with him. And so we were just very committed to making sure our daughter was okay yeah. as, or as okay as she could be. That's um, great. Yeah. So in that sense, you know, we had a, was there a friendship after or kind of just like, not really, yeah, you know, it was yeah. a painful divorce. Um, okay. um, and that unfortunately wasn't really settled, but we were, we were pleasant to each other for our daughter's sake. Yeah. Yeah. So fall of 2012, you started working on a project about Paolo Maccarini. Yeah. What happened This is, um, I think late 2012, actually, um, we started looking into a story about something called regenerative medicine, which is this fascinating field because what it involves is the idea is that we would get to the point where whatever's wrong with you, whatever disease you have, or I don't know, you get in an accident, you need an, a new hand, arm, leg that basically you're going to be able to order up new body parts from the lab, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. just like you would go to the drugstore and it, to buy whatever you yeah, need. Yeah. The idea at its most simple premise is that you, we would get to the point where you can just order whatever you need, you know, from the lab, which obviously has the potential to radically change the face of medicine, right? And mm-hmm. cure diseases that can't be cured right now and help people who can't be helped right now. And so it's this very fascinating field, this sort of groundbreaking field and it involves stem cells, and especially then, stem cells were all the rage. And so we started looking into this field. There was a big article in the New York Times about it, and it was—I mean, it's sci-fi kind of stuff, like yeah, Frankenstein really, kind yeah, of stuff, really you know. Yeah. Totally. And it was really fascinating. And we were interested in doing a story about it. And as we started researching it, there's one name that keeps coming up: Dr. Paolo Maccherini, and he's this Italian surgeon and scientist, and he was considered to be kind of at the forefront of this field of regenerative medicine. And he is radical and he's a pioneer because he was really pushing the envelope. He was doing things that nobody else was doing and he was willing to take risks that nobody else was willing to take. Mm. And he was sort of pushing things out of the box and doing something that literally nobody else in the world was doing at the time. So there was a lot of, there's a, and is a lot of research 
into this field and a lot of, you know, trials being done and a lot of experiments being done. But he was actually doing it. He was putting artificial tracheas, the windpipe, into patients and that they were made out of something that looks like this, like a, a straw, yeah. a little straw. He would take the patient's own stem cells and he would bathe this artificial trachea that's made in a lab in the patient's own stem cells in something like a chicken rotisserie and then implant this surgically um, into the patients. And mm-hmm. so the idea was that this, basically a plastic tube was made in a lab that it would sort of intertwine or you yeah. know, embed with the patient's yeah. own stem yeah. cells and that once transplanted into the patient, this would all magically grow. And I mean, it was it was incredible. And yeah, it sounds amazing. Yeah, and this had the potential to help people who literally, literally had no other hope, who had mm-hmm. been told, "There's nothing we can do for you. You know, yeah. it's over." These are people that had um, everything from accidents, um, car accidents mm-hmm. where they'd lost the windpipe, to cancer, to other diseases, and they yeah. they were being told, "There's nothing we can do for you." And here's this man who's saying, "I can help you." You know, mm-hmm. and he's doing this radical, groundbreaking procedure. And so, you know, immediately he caught our attention. And his nickname was the super surgeon, you know. Mm. And he's this Italian doctor. He's very charming. He's very good looking. He's got this kind of George Clooney thing going yeah. on. Yeah. So yeah. he kind of had this whole, you know, interesting allure about him. And he was working at the place in Sweden, Karolinska, that awards the Nobel Prize in medicine. Mm-hmm. Very prestigious. He's doing clinical trial in Russia. He's working all over the world. And so he was just, he seemed like the perfect person to kind of build this story around. Yeah. And that's how we first became interested in him. The first moment you met him, I know I've heard you describe it in other documentaries, but you said it's like kind of a spark, like something set off in you. Can you describe a little bit more of what that was like? Yeah, we, you know, we reached out to him and we we asked him what surgeries he had coming up. And he was about to do a surgery on this little toddler from Korea, Seoul, South Korea, Hannah, this beautiful Adorable. little girl yeah. who had been born with no trachea at all and had spent her entire little life in the hospital. She'd never left the hospital. <gasps> with a tube inserted, yeah, right? Yeah, she, she had no windpipe. So she, she could not survive without, wow. she had this tube down her throat. She needed basically 24-7 care. So she had lived her whole little life in the hospital. <laughs> So she was going to get this transplant. They were going to bring her from, and not only that, she was. they were going to bring her from Korea to the U.S. to do the transplant. So she was going to be the youngest person in the world to ever get one of these radical transplants. It was going to be the first time this was ever done in the U.S. And so we decided this is the perfect case, sort of build our documentary around. And also her parents are just the most lovely, lovely, lovely people. I just absolutely fell in love with them the first time I talked to them. So we decided to do our story about Hannah. Um, but obviously Dr. Maccarini is also very focal mm-hmm. to the story. And the first time I met him was in February of 2013. He was coming to the U.S. to speak at a conference. He did a lot of that at the time. And we decided to do our first interview with him in Boston. And so we went to Boston to meet him. And, you know, I definitely was intrigued by this man. I think everybody was. You yeah. Know? yeah. I mean, he he's doing something nobody else in the world is doing. And yeah, he's it's kind of like a Elon Musk type of person. Very so much he's so. just like really pushing us, you know, pushing civilization sort of yeah. to the next. And we need people like that in medicine. Mm-hmm. You right. don't, things don't move forward if you don't have people who are willing to take chances take risk, yeah. and take risks. And so he was fascinating, but nothing more than that to me, you know, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but we set up this meeting and we were waiting for him in a restaurant, me and my colleague, and I've never experienced anything like this ever in my life. He, he came in and, you know, I'm sitting there and he comes in around the corner and the second he looked at me and he's he's very good looking and very yeah. charming. But the second he looked at me, I, something happened, like our eyes locked and <clears throat> there was some sort of like almost like electric spark, yeah, which sounds yeah. so ridiculous. <laughs> I don't even know if I believe in love in first sight, but something happened something. and I actually felt like a, you know, some mm. kind of chill go up and down my body and I in my head because I'm so pseudo professional and I was like. Benita, what the hell was that? And whatever that was, just like, no, 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 forget right, it. You know, right. like push it down. Mm-hmm. And I kind of was, and I think I was blushing. I felt like a little schoolgirl. I'm like, I was so flustered. Wow. I thought, what the hell just happened? And I had to take a second in my head to like, okay, whatever that was, like, let's forget it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then it that was just it. You know, then I went right back into professional mode. But there definitely was some kind of instant spark or connection or something between us. 
did you guys have a lot of conversation at the conference or were you just kind of observing him at that conference in Boston? Not a lot of conversation. Okay. We, um, you, you know, didn't like formally interview him at that point. We or? did formally interview okay. him, but I was the producer. I wasn't, okay. I wasn't doing the interview myself. Um, the correspondent was, and I um, had a little bit of interaction with him. You know, he's very flirtatious in general with everybody. I was going to say, do you do that to whoever interviewed him? Yeah, yeah. he's kind of, with men and women. He's, mm. he's got this kind of, like charm. Very self-assured, charming air, and he's you know kind of embodies the George Clooney character. He's you know he's mm-hmm. playful, you know, and and a little bit you know flirty with everybody. Um, he's he's very alluring. Everybody was just kind of like in awe of him. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then I didn't see him again until at least a month later when he flew to Korea because Hannah had to be brought from Seoul, Korea, all the way to Illinois for her surgery, and so he flew to Korea to be on the plane with her um, because it was, it was a risky flight. She was coming on a commercial flight. It was, yeah. a, it was the fastest way to get her here. Um, and on that flight, we sat together on the plane and it's a long flight. I think it's about 13 hours, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly. And we basically talked for about 13 hours. And wow. that was the first time we really kind of got to know each other. And Was that more personal versus professional or were you still kind of trying to keep it professional with him? Or? Um, at the, I mean, at the time nothing was going on i was still trying to keep it professional but it was you know 13 hours is a long yeah, a long yeah, time right, yeah. and we didn't sleep and i at the time i was going through a very difficult time personally um because my ex-husband the father of our daughter um tragically had been diagnosed with brain cancer mm-hmm. and a very aggressive kind of brain cancer and i had gotten a call um while i was in Korea while we were shooting um, that he had taken a turn for the worse and things didn't look good. And I almost left actually. And I was distraught. I was really worried about our daughter and I was worried about him and it just didn't seem like things were going well. And the, the prognosis was never good, but he, he was fighting so hard that I think for a while we all forgot, you know, we all, and if anyone could have beat this damn yeah. cancer, it was John. And I think for a while he went back to work. And I think for a while we all thought, okay. He's going to get better. Yeah, he's he's gonna maybe, he's gonna, maybe yeah. he is going to beat this. Maybe yeah. he'll be the one. And now he'd taken this sudden turn for the worse. And I was already cycling through in my head. Oh my God, what does this mean? You know, yeah. my daughter's alone with him. And there'd been a couple scares. Like he, he obviously wasn't well. Um, he, he missed picking her up from school a couple times. He almost had a couple car accidents. These are things that John never did. You know, he was the most responsible parent ever. And so I was really worried and and also really worried about what happens next. I was starting to think about, Mm -hmm. oh God, you know, is he going to die? When is he going to die? How do I tell my daughter? I mean, he was, she was literally daddy's little girl, you know, he absolutely adored her and vice versa. And so on this plane, I start talking to Apollo, um, about this. And the thing about it was he's such a good listener, yeah. you know, and I must've been, you know, just blah, blah, blabbing. I was kind of pouring my heart out to him and he seemed so caring, you know, and so genuinely interested in this little girl that he'd never met and was giving me very kind, but also very wise advice, you know, mm, I mean, about really. what to tell her, how to tell her, when to tell her, you know, and this is a world renowned surgeon who's obviously dealt with people who have died. And so I'm kind of soaking up the information. And I felt like I could talk to him in a way that I couldn't talk to other people. I mean, I asked him some very specific questions about what's likely to happen, what's, you know, things that you, you know, are difficult to talk about that I couldn't talk to anybody else about. And so during that plane ride is when we became friends. You know, we developed this very close friendship. And then over the course of about the next month, um, Hannah was in Illinois for a while before the transplant actually took place. And there were a lot of trips back and forth and John was declining and Paolo and I would go to dinner sometimes after shoots or go grab a coffee. And this, it was a friendship at first, you know, and what seemed like a really beautiful friendship, you know, yeah. because um, I really needed someone to lean on and he was there and he was giving me, he was really a rock for me. He was giving me really solid advice. And Mm. I thought he was the same as he seemed to be with his patients. I thought this was one of the most genuinely caring, altruistic people I'd ever met in my life. I mean, here was this man who kept saying all he wanted to do was help mankind. He wanted to help people who had no other hope get better. And I believed him. We all believed him. Yeah. You know, and now it seemed like he was doing the same thing with my daughter. 
he why he doesn't he doesn't know me he doesn't know this little girl and i was really kind of you know taken in by him yeah well that that type of person you know doesn't just come along every day seems that genuine and that caring and I, i i totally get it like you you get sucked you know you get sucked into just running into somebody like that and you're like wow you know i yeah. had you ever like captivating like experienced somebody like would you say he was a unique um person that that you've met in your life versus people in the past who he is he is unique because he has this uncanny ability to make you feel like you're the only person in the room right mm. I mean, he, he seemed laser focused on me and on my daughter and now in hindsight of course i realized that i was incredibly vulnerable you yeah. know mm-hmm. i didn't know that at the time But of course, you know, I'm about to become a single parent, you know, even though we were divorced, John was still very much the love of my life, you know, Um, Mm -hmm. and he was the father of our daughter, you know, and I knew I was devastated by what this was going to do to her. And here's a surgeon who is right there and he's saying all of the Mm -hmm. the right things. And exactly did like in his advice was actually good advice. too. It's not like he was just very helpful. Feeding you something very, very helpful. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Had he given you like specific examples from past experiences he, did, he had yeah. been through? I mean, he literally walked through with me. You know, I said, how do I, how do I tell her that her dad's going to die? And contrary to what a lot of people think, because she was nine when her dad died. And, you know, a lot of people think you should tell children less and you shouldn't give them too much information. And certainly they don't need all the details. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was the one that said to me, like, you got to tell her the truth. You know, you have to prepare her. You have to sit down and tell her, basically tell her that, her dad, not in those words, but mm-hmm. her dad's going to die and not sugarcoat it and not, you know, yeah, try you to pretend her... that everything's going to be okay, yeah. which is a little bit of what was happening with some other people, which is normal, you know? Yeah. Um, so hard. And he, it was, it was just very real, you know, and very task oriented, like, okay, do this next, next, do this. And this is what you need to do. And you need to prepare yourself for this. And you need to, all the things that people don't want to talk about and don't mm-hmm. want to think about it. He, he sort of laid it all out for me, you know, and it was extremely helpful. So he really built some trust with you through that whole process. And like you said, you were in a really vulnerable state and he definitely was taking advantage of that. But everybody else around him is also having this similar experience with him, right? Like where everybody is enamored with this man. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was almost it was almost like this man walked on water. Right. I mean, everybody's in awe of him. All the nurses at the hospital in Illinois, all the doctors and everybody because he was this sort of anomaly, right? Yeah. I mean, there's a reason his nickname was the super surgeon, you know? Yeah. He's doing something nobody else in the world is willing to do. He's he's willing to take all the risks that nobody mm-hmm. else is willing to take. And he's ostensibly doing it because he cares about people and because yeah. he wants to change the future of medicine. Yeah. That's very admirable, you know? Right. You know, everybody was sort of, you know, he was the golden boy at Karolinska. Same yeah. thing. He's the golden boy. He's He has the, he's, rumored to be in contention for a Nobel Prize himself. You know, he's doing these amazing things. He's bringing in money and accolades and writing papers. And yeah. there's so much hope and promise attached to his this man. And everybody's kind of riding this wave. I mean, we all do that naturally anyway. You know, you he seemed like a, a true rebel, a true pioneer, but in the best way, you know. And everybody wanted to be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And he was just so, his personality yeah. and the way he went about life, he's just this calm, cool guy who's... Well, he's very dapper. He dresses yeah. beautifully. He's Italian. Yeah. He's riding yeah. his yeah. motorcycle. Yeah. 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 You know, he rides his motorcycles all the time. You Your know? friend it, compared him to that one commercial. Uh, the the um, most the interesting man commercial. in the world. Yeah, the most interesting... <laughs> Dos Yeah. The yeah. yeah. <laughs> most interesting man yeah. in the world. Yeah. yeah. And he spoke like six or seven languages. Yeah. And, I mean, he was just, he was, yeah, he definitely had that thing, you know? So impressive. Yeah. Well, that that's why I kind of compared it to like Elon Musk because yeah. everybody's got this like a lot, of, I should say a lot of people, they kind of view him as like, oh, he's almost like this God complex. Right. He's mm-hmm. like yeah. a savior for the world because he's out there trying to push civilization Especially Elon forward. like a few years ago. Yeah, a few years. I mean, he's, yeah, he's kind of gone away from that, you know, trying to please everybody, but Savior is a good word. I think that's what savior, people saw him as. A you know? savior, yeah. And like, we need we we all which, need people like that. We want people like that in the yeah, world, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, the, we're not going anywhere. Right. We need those people to push the envelope. And, yes. And you know, as long as you're doing it with integrity. So I was going to ask you when you were started working on this piece on on Palo, what was it, you guys obviously researched his background mm-hmm. and his um, education and things yeah. like that. And and at first glance, 
everything checked out or and i don't know how far you it's not like you were checking his credentials at that point right so what did you learn about his background and his professional career i mean at the time the man was was vouched for and vetted by he's at carolinska some of the most famous institutions Mm -hmm. and doctors in the world you know he works at the place that awards the Nobel Prize in medicine, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, he's doing this huge clinical trial in Russia. Nobody had anything really bad to say about him other than that he could be a bit arrogant. Um, and the only real complaint we heard about him was that he was doing so many different things that he often didn't stay. He would do a surgery and then he would be off to the next Honestly, one. And yeah. he wasn't good about staying in one place, but that, that also seemed understandable. Um, the only tiny... I wouldn't call it tiny, but the only red flag that came up as we were researching the story is there were some charges in Italy of extortion. Mm-hmm. And we actually, when, and I think this came before we met him in person. Yeah, it did. Um, and he was placed under house arrest for a very brief period in Italy um, for extortion. We all went, oh God, you know, like, and I actually thought we were going to have to you know, kill the whole story. And of course, everything was in motion at the time for him to come to Illinois and do the surgery on Hannah in Illinois. And that meant he needed a medical license to do surgery in the U.S. He needed FDA approval. And so we were in touch with those people and the lawyers and everything. And there was a couple tense weeks where I thought, okay, what does this mean? But then the charges were dropped and he was cleared. And the lawyers that were dealing with the FDA approval and the medical license assured us like, no, we've checked it out. Everything's fine. These are just some, you know, baseless accusations and these are angry patients who are accusing him of you know trying to extort money and so it seemed like it was nothing to worry about Hmm. because a lot of doctors do face stuff like that exactly fairly common i feel like there's so many people out there like me who wish they would have taken a language in school or just taken their classes more seriously maybe pursued it into college even but it's never too late to start learning a new language with Babbel. Babbel is the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions. Thanks to Babbel's addictively fun and easy bite-sized language lessons, you can finally cross learning that new language off your list. That's the thing too, is I think a lot of us think we need all this time to dedicate to learning a new language, but with Babbel, you only need 10 minutes to complete a lesson. We all have at least 10 minutes to spare every single day, whether that's waiting for the bus or on public transit or you're on the toilet. It's only 10 minutes and you can start having real life conversations in a new language in as little as three weeks. Other language learning apps out there use AI for their lesson plans, which doesn't sound too fun to me. But Babbel lessons were created by over 150 language experts and voiced by real native speakers, not computers. Their teaching method has been scientifically proven to be effective. And with Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian and German. So maybe you want to learn one language or you can learn all 14. Babbel's got that for you. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you to improve your pronunciation and accent. Once you think all of us when learning a foreign language, that's what we care about most is being able to speak it and not sound absolutely insane when we do it. There are so many fun ways to learn with Babbel, too. In addition to lessons, you can access podcasts, games, videos, stories, and even live classes. And best of all, it comes with a 20-day money-back guarantee, so you got nothing to lose to at least try it out. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, get up to 55% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash mile higher. That's babbel.com slash mile higher for up to 55% off your subscription. Babbel's language for life. Just for, for those listening, according yeah, to all of his colleagues, his, his academic um, career is obviously very impressive. And he received his medical degree from the University of Pisa in Italy in 1986 and his Master of Surgery in 1991. And also while earning his master of surgery at the University of Alabama at Birmingham, Mm -hmm. he took some courses, but he says he also got a degree in biostatistics there as well, which we found out is not necessarily the case. Um, But then he worked as a, as a professor as well. I think the point was he was, he was both a surgeon and a scientist and he had multiple degrees and had worked all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was no reason, unfortunately at the time to doubt him. To question him. Yeah. Right. That's interesting because I was wondering about that too. I was like, how how is he going to get approval to do surgery here in the United States? Yeah, I had to go through the FDA, right? And, and that's not an easy thing to do. Getting FDA approval is not easy. Getting a getting a medical license when you're not a doctor in this country to do yeah. a surgery here is not easy. Yeah, and he got both of those things. Yeah, and that tells you a lot right there. You know, everybody believed this man. When did things start turning romantic with Paolo? 
there's obviously a sort of gradual build yeah. up to this. It's not I mean, like the next day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, this is over months. We're friends, you know, mm-hmm. and this is coinciding with, you know, my ex-husband getting worse and worse and worse. And Hannah has her surgery in April of 2013 and initially is doing very well. And at the same time, things are, are very radically and drastically declining, you know, with John and um, he goes into hospice and it's, it's, you know, it's obvious what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I was really struggling with it. Um, I knew it was coming. I didn't know when, and, you know, Paulo's talking me through all of this, but there was a a, a particular day um, where I was, I was really upset. And I think he passed me in the hallway of the hospital or something. And he could, he texted me and he said, are you okay? And, you know, I said, no. Um, and he asked me if I wanted to talk and I just said, I'm, I don't know if I'm going to make it home in time, you know, to say goodbye to him. And, um, he said, you need to find a way to say goodbye to him your own way. It doesn't matter what it is, but you need, you know, he said, trust me on this. You need to do something just for yourself and for your daughter so that you feel like you've said goodbye to him, even if you don't, you know, get to see him before he, he dies. And, I thought, okay. And I thought about it for a while and I, I called him the next day and I said, I, I know what I want to do. And he said, okay, I'm going to help you. John's favorite flower, which we had at our wedding is bird of paradise. It's just yeah. a very beautiful, exotic flower. And Paolo had him, he loves to ride motorcycles and we had filmed him for B-roll, you know, yeah. riding around on his motorcycle and he yeah. still had the motorcycle. So yeah. he took me on the motorcycle to a flower shop and I went in and I got three birds of paradise, which were for me, my daughter and, and John. And I said, I want to find some water somewhere and just, you know, kind of throw them in the water. And so he drove me along the Illinois river, um, for a long time. And I finally found a place probably about after 30 minutes where, um, I said, you know, we can stop here. And so he's, he stayed on the bike and he, I walked to the water and, you know, did my thing through the, through the flowers into the water. And I was probably there about 15, 20 minutes, something like that. And, I came back and I'm walking towards him on the motorcycle and I'm crying, you know, tears are streaming down my face. And um, I'm obviously in a very reflective, melancholy mood. And as I walk up to Paolo, he looks at me and he just grabbed me and hugged me, you know, and Mm -hmm. not just any hug, you know, but one of those really tight kind of bear hug, you know, really embracing me and so heartfelt it felt like. And so Mm -hmm. I, I so needed it at that time. And, we didn't say anything, you know, to each other. He mm-hmm. just held me and, you know, I'm tears are streaming down my face. And it was at that moment for me, I thought, oh man, you know, I'm falling for this yeah. guy. You know, I knew it. I like, I'm, I'm falling for this guy. And that was a problem. And that was a problem because in journalism, you know, there is this sort of unwritten rule mm-hmm. that you don't become involved with the subject of a story. Mm-hmm. And there's a very good reason for this, right? You right. know, it's, it's kind of the cardinal rule in journalism because if I'm doing a story about you and we become too close, obviously my objectivity can, can fly out yeah, the window. You know, right. you're not, you're supposed to maintain, of course you get close to people as you're doing stories about them, because I think it makes you a better storyteller. Yeah. Um, but you're, there's a line, an invisible line you don't cross because you don't want your objectivity to be compromised. And, you know, we were still in the middle of doing this documentary about him. And so this was a no, no. And I knew it. And I thought, well, oh, you know, what the hell am I going to do? Because this had been building for months. I mm. needed, I desperately needed somebody to just kind of wrap their arms around me and tell me everything was okay. And so I was, it was hard. I was really fighting with myself. Yeah. And I mean, it's such a romantic setting and for him to ride on the motorcycle yeah. and yeah, I can totally see how that would be a very captivating moment. So you pretty much kind of hit the ground running from there with your relationship. Um, yeah, pretty much. I was resistant, you know, I was, I was wrestling with myself. Um, Mm -hmm. but then John passed away in June of 2013 and I was just a mess, you know, and, um, obviously extremely worried about our daughter and it was just a very difficult time. Mm -hmm. And we were finished shooting the story at that point. And Paula said to me, you know, I want to take you somewhere for the weekend. You know, I, w- I just want to get your head out of all this. You know, um, I was at my mom's house in Michigan with my daughter. So she already had somewhere to stay. And he just said, I think you need a break, you know, and I want to take you somewhere and surprise you. And 
I just, I said, yes. I said, okay, you know. Um, and so he takes me on what would become one of many surprise trips. And he takes me to Venice, you know, like oh. the most romantic yeah. place in the world, you totally. know. Um, and it was like romance on steroids. And this yeah. set the, you know, precedent for many, many romantic trips. And it was just, I, it was incredible. You know, I had, I had never experienced anything like this in my life. It, it was romance on overdrive i mean mm -hmm. everything the best hotel room walk in the hotel room and there's yeah. dozens of roses yeah. the best champagne waiting in a bucket it's like you what know? are you supposed to do like I, well it felt like i was in a movie yeah. you know yeah. I, I literally felt like i was in a movie i just you know he planned everything out he got I, I, we were only gone maybe three days it was a short trip but he got private tour guide private boat to take us to all these little wow. islands and i mean it was just romance 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 you know and yeah. he we went to museums and he's so knowledgeable and, you know, he's talking about all these things and it was just the most beautiful trip. Um, Were yeah. you guys like a couple at this point or are you still kind of just casually dating? At, at, or By the end it? of this trip, we were a couple. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> by the end of this yeah. trip, this was I was kinda, done. You yeah, know, I mean, like, I was just, you know, in hindsight, he was moving very fast, but I think I was not aware of that at the time because of, mm. I was so caught up in the, in, you know, the grief of losing yeah. John and Locking worrying about on. my daughter. Um, but he was, things were moving very quickly, um, too quickly in hindsight, but I, I was not cognizant of that at the time. So looking back, you said he was really knowledgeable about things on these tours. Do you question any of the things he was telling you? No, I think the man is brilliant. You know? Oh, you really, I really do. do. I think he's very intelligent. Um, mm -hmm. And that's part of the tragedy of this. And yeah. also, also part of what makes him so damn good at what he does, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, and part of the reason he got away with it for so long. He's yeah. very intelligent. Yes. So where was he living at the time? Or where did he tell you he was living? He was living in Barcelona. And one of the first things he told me, you know, while we were in the sort of friendship stage of our, our relationship is that he had been separated from his Italian wife for many, many years. He had two children who were in their sort of late teens, early 20s at the time. Mm -hmm. And he said that they lived separate lives, lives. His wife lived in Italy. He lived in the house in Barcelona. He had been there at that point at least five years or something like that. Um, and this was well established. I mean, I heard other doctors and people talking about the house in Barcelona. Hmm. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't a secret. And he just said that, you know, they're Catholic, it's Italy, and that getting divorced was complicated. And they'd never had a reason to get divorced, that they had an, you know, hmm. amicable relationship with the kids and that... Because it's difficult and because of the kids, they'd never, you know, he'd never to wanted to that. actually get divorced. Um, so that was fine. And then he tells me, and I guess it was probably not long after that Venice trip. He said, well, you know, I've fallen so in love with you. Now I actually want to get a divorce. I'm going to file for divorce. Mm. And I believed him. I had mm -hmm. no reason not to believe him. So it wasn't, you know, some people think I didn't know that, you know, about the Italian wife. I knew about her from the beginning, you know. Yeah. Um, and that it just wasn't an issue, you know. I mean, they they'd been living separate lives for a long time. It made sense to you too, and then you've been through a divorce. Yeah, so I you mean, understand. I come from a divorced family. My parents, yeah, are divorced. Um, I was obviously divorced from John. I also had this very brief second marriage, which was kind of an unfortunate mm. mistake. But mm. um, I I got remarried not that long before I met him, actually, in in late 2012. And lovely, lovely guy, just the wrong guy for mm. me. And I I it was just bad timing. Um, and then John got sick right after that. And the, the minute John got sick, I just knew that this person was the wrong person for me. And our, the marriage dissolved literally within months, you know, okay. I probably should have gotten it annulled, but I, I didn't. We just filed, we separated almost immediately and mm -hmm. filed for divorce. So I actually always forget about this marriage because it yeah. almost doesn't exist in yeah. my head. But sometimes people go back and they're like, wait, <laughs> yeah, there, there was another one in there. Um, lovely, lovely guy, just the wrong guy. And it, it was yeah. a marriage that should, just shouldn't have happened. Point yeah. being, I understand divorce and I understand how complicated divorce yeah. is, especially when kids are involved, you know, yes. and I was very sensitive to that. Yeah. Um, so Res I, you want to respect him, yeah. his decision, how he's, you know, I was with fine with it. Yeah. Yeah. But at this point, you guys are fully in a relationship. Yep. Are you public about this relationship? No. And this okay. was the hard thing because even though we were finished shooting the story, you know, it was still being edited and I didn't want to tell anyone at work that we were involved. And were you worried about I was, if that I, came I out? agonized. I agonized over oh, it. Sure. This, this yeah. was so difficult for me. Yes. I, I kept saying to him, we should wait. You know, we need to wait until the story's done. But I'm so in love with this man and I so need this mm -hmm. at the time that 
turning my back on it was really hard. And my friends, especially people that aren't in the business, were like, I don't, why would, why, yeah. you know, this man's crazy about you. Why would you, why don't would let you it go. run away yeah. from this? But it was eating at me, you know? Yeah. Um, and we did actually, there was a period a few months later where um, we had to do more shooting on the story. And I just said to him, we, we got to put the brakes on this. You know, we have to mm -hmm. wait. You know, I, I would feel more comfortable if we wait until the stories aired. And there was about a three month period where we didn't see each other. And he was miserable. He, he was so upset with me. Um, he was in Europe and he was whining and complaining about it all the time. And he, he was really unhappy about it. But I didn't, I, you know, I didn't feel right about not telling people at work. And I, I was really having a hard time with it. But then, um, you know, John died June of 2014, and that summer, while well, my daughter was at summer camp, she always goes to the summer camp in Pennsylvania, and we wanted to keep mm -hmm. her routine, so this overnight camp, she would go for four to six weeks, and while she was there, um, I had my own, I had my own health scare. Um, mm -hmm. I had uterine fibroids, and I'd always had them, um, but probably because of all the stress with John and everything, they suddenly exploded yeah. and like we're overtaking my uterus and my doctor called and she basically said listen you know these need to come out and i can't tell you until they come out if it's cancer or not oh, and I'm like, it's the you know worst it was like worst case it was nightmare you know yeah. i'm like i no, no this can't be happening my daughter just lost yeah. her dad this i cannot be sick this cannot be happening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i had surgery scheduled in september um to get them out and we had one interview left to do with Paulo. And so we flew him to New York to do this interview. And he knew, we were talking, but very sporadically. And he knew that I was having the surgery. And he said, and this is all by email. We weren't talking on the phone. He said, I'm, I'm going to, we had a shoot with him and I literally had surgery the next morning. And he said, I'm going to stay in New York the, the whole weekend, you know, just to make sure that you're okay. And I said, why would you do that? You know, you can't come to the hospital. I don't want to see you. And he said, nope. I'm going to, I'm going to, I can't leave New York until I know that you're okay. And that was another thing that I just thought, wow, you know, yes. who, who does that? You know? Um, so, he, you know, here he is sitting in this hotel room somewhere in New York, um, waiting to find out if I've recovered from the surgery and I'm okay. And after the surgery, um, I just had this kind of realization. I thought, what am I doing? You know, I've been through so much, you know, John just died. I just had this health scare. And they hadn't told me 100% definitively, but they told me after the surgery that it looked like everything was okay. So yeah. it looked like I was going to get a you know clean bill of health. And I just thought, this is nuts. This man is sitting in this hotel room that I'm madly in love with, and I'm not even letting him you know come to the hospital. And so I texted him. I said, you know what? Come and see me. I want to see you. Mm. And he comes, and again, out of a movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And my mother was there. He he comes to the hospital and he walks in with a single red rose. Oh um, my gosh! And he he gives it to me and he he was just so sweet, you know. I mean, he was walking me up and down the hallways yeah. because it's abdominal surgery. It's not unlike a, a C section or any other abdominal surgery. You know, it's very difficult to walk afterwards. Yeah. And he was so tender and sweet, and you know, he didn't stay that long. Didn't ask for anything. But he after he left, um, and my mother looks at me and she's like. Ben, you're crazy, wow. yeah. you know, you know, he's amazing. And I, I don't right know what here. you're running away from, but, and even there, I had a roommate and she's like, who was that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so then a couple of days later, you know, I, I reached out to him and I said, look, you know, I want to see you again. Yeah. It's almost kind of like a life is short. Why waste exactly. time moment? Yeah. Hey, that's exactly what it was. I was mm -hmm. going to ask you, this is kind of off the topic that we're on right now, but I'm just I'm, in my head. I'm like, when you guys initially, you know, after that Venice trip, did you guys have like, what was the depth of the conversations that you had? Like, did you feel like, did he share about his past, his childhood? Like, did you guys ever go the, go there or did so it kind of stay? interesting, especially in hindsight, he was in constant communication, you know, I wouldn't really, I wouldn't necessarily call it love bombing, but I guess it is a kind mm -hmm. of form of love bombing. You yeah. know, he, we were in communication all day long, every day, no matter where he was, you know, texting he would send me video love messages all the time he would leave voicemails he would you know we were never not in communication my love good morning i hope that you slept very well and had a chance to dream of us um i miss you very much but 
I'm so happy to see you so soon again. Something I realized that he did, which I now always tell other women to look out for, is he put a lot of focus on me. You know, he asked a lot of questions about me. And this is a tactic that con artists use. They extract mm -hmm. all kinds of information from you. They don't give you a lot of information about themselves. Yeah. And they're so busy focused on you and that, you know, that you don't even realize what's happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the information I got about him was limited, you know, and I would ask questions. Obviously, I'm a journalist. I yeah, probe right. that yeah. he would change the subject. He would tell me mm -hmm. a little He'd, bit, but okay. in, in hindsight, it was way more about me. You know, he knew way more about me than I knew about him. We did wow. talk about things. We talked about his childhood. We talked about his family. He talked a lot about um, his father dying and how hard that had been on him and mm -hmm. how difficult it had been growing up. He was sent to a school in um, um, Swiss Germany, um, and he didn't like it, and he talked a lot about that, and he talked about how close he was to his mother. Um, but there was not a lot of deep, deep detail. Most of it was about how difficult it was to be a pioneer. and the enemies that he had and that there were people that were jealous and the mm. people that wanted to take him down and how he painted himself as this sort of isolated figure, you know, that was at the top of the mountain trying to push things forward. And that, you know, he, he was constantly having to deflect all these people that wanted to take him down and were jealous and didn't want to see him succeed. Mm. So he talked a lot about that. Did he talk about that only with you or would he open up about that with other people? I felt you know like of. he was talking about it only with me. Um, and he certainly said that, you know, and he would always say, I've never been able to talk to anyone like this. I've never had a relationship like this before. You know, you're everything, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he was very effusive with the compliments. He really made me feel like we had something very, very special okay. and that he had never experienced. Got and he said that all the time. Okay. I've never experienced love like this before. I've never been able to talk to somebody like this before. That's what I was curious I've about. I've never it. had somebody who understood me the way you understand me. All those kind of things. So, okay. That 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 clears up what I, what I was wondering about. Because I'm like, you know, was, had he been through this before? Or was this truly like to him, you know, he, your past just kind of randomly crossed. And to, in his eyes, it was like. I've never experienced this before. He said it all the time. Yeah. You know? I've yeah. never I've never been loved like this before. I've never loved a woman like this before. I've never mm. experienced anything like this before. It's constant. I have thousands of texts saying this. And yeah. you and you supported him for for a long time and and I'm just thinking about those conversations that he's having with you as almost like you know, he's not wanting to go into, you know, all of these other things and, you know, deeper levels of who he is, but he's focused on his professional career mm -hmm. and his enemies and he's making sure that he tells you those parts because mm -hmm. you know he's sort of rallying your support look in hindsight i think it may have been very calculated you know that's I, that's what i, I think in hindsight yeah. i wouldn't find out until much later that things were starting to unravel in his career and that hadn't been made public yet but clearly he had to know you know that things were starting that trouble was brewing and maybe he targeted me because he thought I could help him, you know, as a journalist mm. and somebody that could be in his corner. And maybe part of his tactic was, you know, let me get her on my side and in my yeah. corner. And of course, I'm doing what any loving partner would, you know, yeah, I believe him, you yeah. know, and mm -hmm. um, I was 100 percent supportive. So that may that very well may have been very calculated. That's that's what that's I'm, I'm thinking. I'm like, wow, like. And, and when you think about like, especially right now, you're like. At what point did that calculated plan start? Click you know, in, what yeah. did that mm -hmm. start when? Or was it there from day one? For, yeah, was it, it like was it he there saw you come in? Yeah, yeah, it's like whoa, wow. and that that's the scary part is like, at what point did that start? Exactly, and, and was any of it real or was it just part of part of the know. plan? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and that's it was real to me. <sighs> yeah. Well, so the relationship progressed pretty quickly, and yep. you guys went on many different trips. You traveled all over the world. What? Yeah. Russia. Got any stories? <laughs> so, many, <laughs> so many romantic trips. I mean, we went to, I probably can't even name them all, um, Greece, Russia, London, the Bahamas twice. Wow. My daughter came on some of these trips, Mexico, mm -hmm. Turkey, and just so romantic. You know, so mm -hmm. romantic. Everything was so romantic. Every, everywhere we went, he loved to surprise me. That was his mm -hmm. thing. He was so into surprises. and. Every surprise was bigger than the last surprise and more over the top than the last surprise. And oh my gosh. everywhere we went, you know, it was romance on overdrive. Yeah. And to the point that we would go on these trips and literally every time somebody inevitably from the front desk or somewhere at the hotel would pull me aside, you know, some woman say, 
you know, where'd you find this guy? How do yeah. I get one of those? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Does he have a brother? And, you mm-hmm. know, and they would get all invested into it, you know? I mean, in Greece, there's, and there's video of it. There's rose petals all over the floor and rose petals on the bed spelling out, I love you. And, wow. you know, and he would, he would do all this and get all the hotel staff involved and wow. so many things to the, to the point that sometimes I was like, stop, you know, like it, it doesn't have to be. I was going to say, did you ever get like embarrassed or like, t- yeah. just like, okay, this yeah. is like a little much. Like it doesn't need to be this all the time. Yeah. And also the other thing is, which was weird later, um, because it was like he was documenting his own demise, but he was always videotaping. Yeah. That, that's yeah. that's what I thought was strange. All the time. I was like, I can't, I have so many videos where I'm like, turn the camera off, please stop. Not everything has to be on videotape. Mm. Um, I took a lot of pictures. I've always, photography's always been my hobby. So I took a lot of pictures, but he was always videotaping. And there's one video where I'm actually sort of mocking him. I'm saying, this isn't a documentary. Yeah. <laughs> and and he's like, no, it's just for me. So, so he's just got of, his phone out or do you bring like a no, camera? No, he had like a nice camera. Oh, so he's like wow. capturing all the work that he's doing here, all the... The surprises. He's very proud of himself for everything. Yeah, else. which I mean, if you want to get into the nitty gritty of it later, that's been compared to like you know, if you want to get really grim, like a serial killer, you know, yeah. documenting. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. a little weird. It yeah. is. Yeah, it is a little weird. And he was also spending a lot on just like because you're not and... paying for these trips. He's did no, you? No, I mean, for like him? I paid here and there. Yeah, you know, I'd yeah. buy a plane ticket here and there if he said mm-hmm. come see me somewhere, and um, I spoiled him too, not the same way he was spoiling me, but. He spent money like money was growing on trees, you know? I mean, money was not an issue for him. And that's one of the weirdest things because most con artists, not all of them, but, you know, somebody like the Tinder swindler guy or the, you know, they're Mm -hmm. after money, you know? Ultimately, what they want is money. They might spend a little money at the beginning to make you think that they're into you and they have money, but money was not his thing. I mean, and he would take groups of my friends and family out and pay for everybody Mm -hmm. and not just pay for everybody, but get you know, the nicest 10 bottles of the champagne. nicest champagne. Wow. The, he spent so much money. It was nuts. Yeah, Which all your it. friends are like, woo, this is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he cooked, you know, he would, he would cook. God. He loved to cook. He would cook meals at home and cook lobster and all these, you know, beautiful dishes for people and my family. And, um, wow. and, and that, and that was the other thing. I mean, there was this sort of extravagant romance going on, but some of my favorite moments were really the simple ones at home. Mm-hmm. I mean, he, you know, my favorite things were I would come home from work and he would have a whole meal prepared. He'd been cooking for hours, you know, the candles burning and the music playing. God. And then we'd eat dinner. And then, you know, me and Paolo and my daughter would sit there and play games, you know, play Scrabble yeah. or watch a movie. I mean, he just, there was wow. this kind of wildly arrogant, excessive, you know, over the top side of him. But there were also a lot of really just simple, beautiful moments. And I mean, who wouldn't think that was real? Yeah. I mean, he spent a lot of time with us, like a yeah. lot of time. Yeah. Do you feel like those uh, more real moments were in fact real? Like, did he, you know, obviously he had children and things like that. Do you do you wonder if he gave his own children that sort of experience? Like, and, was he maybe, really bonding with you right, guys in yeah. some ways? It felt like it, you yeah. know, and he devoted so much attention to my daughter. Mm-hmm. Scott invested in her, too. and So he got so invested in her, in it, you know, and she fell head over heels in love with him, too, at the beginning, you know, and he, he was wooing her the same way he was wooing me. He spent a lot of time with my friends. You know, I had a friend that was diagnosed with breast cancer and he insisted on sending her money. You know, he spent time on the phone with her. You know, she flew to New York one weekend and he spent hours sitting with her talking about her treatment. And I mean, it's just it's just baffling in hindsight that he the amount of time and energy that he spent Mm -hmm. on this and to, to, to know that the whole time he was conning me now is just just insane. Yeah, I just I don't. I don't understand it. And it's still the subject of much debate. There, there are people that will swear to this day, there's like, no way that man didn't love you. He doted on you. We saw the way he looked at you. He adored you. You know, we spent time yeah, with you. Yeah. And it just, you can't. How could that have been fake? How could it be fake? Right. Who can right. act like that? Nobody's that good of an actor. Do you think he loved you? Or you still don't know? I don't know. Mm-hmm. I go back and forth about this one a little bit because maybe in his sick, twisted head, He loved me the best he could. I think he needed me, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Was it all for selfish, nefarious reasons? I don't know, you know. Did he fall in love with me and then he just got in too far and he was over his head and he didn't know how to get out of it and it got out of control? I don't don't know, you know. He has never to this day, you know, I've been talking publicly about this for seven years, you know. Mm -hmm. He's never said a word, you know. Um, I don't know. I just don't know. I, I, there 
some of my own family members will, you know, we'll get into debates about it. You mm-hmm. know, we'll swear. Was like, the love real? Yeah, yeah. There's no way he didn't love you. But sociopaths, true mm-hmm. sociopaths, if he is one, are very, very good actors, you yes. know? Yep. And they're very good at studying people and mimicking. So they know how to behave like yeah. they're in love or right. or behave like they're whatever, you know, mm-hmm. fake doctor, fake. Not that he's he is actually a real doctor. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't well, know the answer were, to yeah. that one. We were kind of discussing that yeah. earlier that maybe he had picked up some things from movies because he would go on these long flights yes. and maybe he was literally watching movies well, the play romance. and recreating the, the romance, romance stuff. I'm like, yeah. come on now. That's, I mean, there are none scenes of that's out original of, for, for my, him. My friend sat there one day and started going through. She's like, that's not a pretty woman. Yeah. And that's out of this movie. And that's yeah. out of that movie. And I'm like, oh my God, you're right. You know? <laughs> but he really looked perfect on paper. I mean, Perfect. He, he checked every box. He like, really like did. literally every box. You know. I mean, he's really a character to know all these languages, know how to play the piano. He's so established in his career. He was well, kind he and you. he was caring yeah. and he, yeah, yep. He, and can cook. And your daughter loves what him. Did can't anyone in your life was there say, any weakness there? Yeah. Did he have a weakness? Well, I mean, that's another thing. The one thing I love to dance. You know, and mm-hmm. when I oh, met yeah, him, can't dance, huh? He was always apologizing <laughs> oh, yeah. to me. One of his nicknames was the sexy professor because he's a he's a scientist and a surgeon and I called him the sexy professor and like, I'm sorry your sexy professor doesn't know how to dance and but it's okay you know couples don't have to do everything together you know mm-hmm. and he would say this all the time and I didn't I really didn't mind but then we were on vacation in Mexico one time with my daughter and we go into this little place and obviously they play a lot of you know Latin music in Mexico mm-hmm. and I see him go up to the to the bar they were playing something but it wasn't salsa music and all of a sudden, salsa music comes on, and he walks over and he grabs my hand, and I'm utterly confused. And he starts dancing with me, and I, you know, and I'm wow. looking at him like, "What the hell?" <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. And then he says, "I've been secretly taking lessons in Russia for three months, you know, because I wanted to surprise you. I learned how to salsa dance." <laughs> oh my gosh, this so like on top like... of everything, now he learned how to salsa dance. So, yeah, he wasn't that good, but he, at least it, you yeah. know the fact that he had done this just for me, and yes. then. We went to a dinner a couple, I think it was my birthday a couple weeks later, and he's dancing with all my friends and everybody was Gosh. just like, Blown who away. is this yeah. guy, you know, yeah. and who yeah. does this? And it, again, it just seemed like a really romantic thing, you know? Like Did he, a single person in your life ever bring up to you that they were concerned about him? Not to my face. Mm. So, and I'm fast forwarding now to after I find out he's lying about everything, which we can backtrack to. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> what's interesting to me about that, there were a few people, mostly men, Interest. See, that's yeah, interesting. Which is really interesting. One yeah. of my one of my closest friends told me we had gone to have um, drinks at their house one night um, in Michigan. She's an old friend of mine from Michigan, and she and her husband got into a huge fight after we left. And at this point, the wedding was already in, and they were planned, and they were coming to the wedding. And she never told me about it, but she said they got in a huge fight because he said to her. There's something about him I don't like. I don't know what it is. I can't put my finger on it, but I don't trust him. And she she blew up on him. She's like, my friend is happy. They're getting married. We're yeah. going to the wedding. Why are you, you know, why are you being like this? But, and she didn't tell me that until later. Um, mm. And then there are two other like husbands or boyfriends of people were sort of quietly, but it wasn't something specific or concrete. It wasn't like they mm. could say he's yeah. lying or give he's you, lying about give this. Give an example. Specifically. It was just a vibe or something that yeah. didn't sit right with them. Like, you don't think this is too good to be true, right? Like, it's just, there's nothing wrong with this. Did he, I was going to ask you too, did he, did you ever catch him in a lie? No. While you're with him? Never. Wow. Wow. Or just even about something stupid or silly or like, you know, sometimes. Not that I can remember. And if mm-hmm. I did, he must have, you know. Did you take out the trash? Yeah. And then no, you know, something stupid like that. Nothing like that. I mean, in hindsight, there are lots I can think of. Yeah. but um, <laughs> Nothing major though. No, there was one related to the wedding, but we I, we should get back and talk about the wedding before yeah. I tell that one. <laughs> yeah. Good health starts with good habits, and Quip makes it easy by delivering all the oral care essentials that you need to care for your mouth. Did you know the Quip electric toothbrush is loved by over 7 million mouths and has timed sonic vibrations with 30-second pulses to guide a dentist-recommended two-minute clean? It's also lightweight. It's got a sleek design for adults and kids. And what's great is there's no wires or bulky charger to weigh you down. Plus, it comes with a great multi-use travel cover that doubles as a mirror mount for less clutter. And their reusable handles come in a range of sleek metal hues, including the best-selling all black and all pink, as well as bright plastic colors that are sure to make a pop to your bathroom counter. On top of your brushing, you can upgrade your Quip with a new smart motor to track and improve your brushing with the free Quip app. 
And you can earn amazing rewards like free refills, products, Target gift cards, and more. And Quip has everything that you need to build a complete routine, including anti-cavity toothpaste that comes in mint or watermelon that helps prevent cavities, two ways to floss, floss string that expands to clean and reusable floss picks that replace over 180 disposable picks with every refill, refillable gum that's sugar-free and long-lasting, and a refillable mouthwash that's a four times concentrate. Plus, it's good for you and good for the planet. And shipping is free, so you can save money and skip the hustle bustle of in-store shopping. So just go to getquip.com slash milehigher right now and you'll get your first refill for free. That's your first refill at getquip.com slash milehigher spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash milehigher. Quip, the good habits company. Let's quickly jump to your trip to Moscow mm. because mm-hmm. that is mm-hmm. kind of a, would yeah. you call it a pivotal, pivotal very moment pivotal. there? Yeah. yeah, very pivotal in terms of my trust for your him. Your trust, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'd had I'd had the surgery to have the fibroids out. I got a clean bill of health. Everything was fine. But I developed after the surgery a terrible infection in the incision. It was really bad. And for months, they were trying me on all these different antibiotics, and nothing would get rid of this infection. Um, and then it finally cleared up enough because we had this trip planned to Moscow. He wanted He was doing a clinical trial in Russia, and he kept saying, I want to take you to Russia. I'd never been to Moscow. I re- was really excited to go. And we kept having to postpone the trip. And then finally... I think it was November of 2014, so about three months after the surgery. I was doing well enough that my doctor cleared me to fly, and I flew to Moscow. I still had a little bit of the infection, so I was still on antibiotics, and I was traveling with stuff to sort of clean the wound if I, if I needed to. And we went to dinner one night. We are again, just, you know, beautiful, romantic trip, you know, gorgeous hotel. Um, and we were at dinner, and I didn't feel well, and I, I kind of instinctively knew something was wrong, and I... I tapped his hand. I'm like, you know, I'm, not, I'm something's something's not right, you know. And we very quickly got out of the restaurant. We went back to the hotel, and he'd gotten in the practice of having me lie down on the bed every night just to look at the incision and make sure everything was okay. Yeah. So we'd been doing that every and every night anyway. Mm. We get to the hotel, you know, and I take off my clothes so that he can look at the incision, and very few words were exchanged. He just kind of looked at me, mm. and as soon as he looked at me, I thought, oh. You know, yeah, and, something's up. Yeah. And he just looked at me and he said, Do you trust me? Mm. And I said, Of course I do. Wow. And he nodded. And I knew what was coming. And I said, Get me another glass of wine. And we'd had oh. wine at the restaurant and we had, you know, some wine in the mini bar. And he went, he poured me a glass of wine, which I promptly slugged. Yeah. And he went into the bathroom and I had these scissors, like, Cosmetic scissors. Yeah. It's a little travel thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not little bit. Serious scissors, but like cosmetic scissors. And he went in the bathroom and he got my scissors and sterilized them with something. I don't know what. I hope it wasn't just hot water. But um, I think I had the equivalent of hydrogen peroxide in some form. And he sterilized them. And he came out. And again, we don't talk, you know, and he's got these scissors in his hands. And I just take a deep breath. And he literally like. No. Kind of stabbed me with the scissors, to be honest. Wow. And were you watching? No. <laughs> I'm yeah. screaming. I can't. Yeah, get I was out. Say. Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, thank you. About this. I know. Oh my gosh. And but when he did that, all this disgusting green, yellow, nasty infection, you know, infected stuff came out, Plus like oozing stuff, out. Yeah. Oh man. And the next day, I actually felt better. But what was interesting about that night, I kept saying to him, especially after he did it, you know, and he kept saying everything's going to be fine by tomorrow. I think I fell asleep not long after that, but. I said, you know, shouldn't we go to a hospital? Shouldn't we go, you know? And of course, he got very upset. You know, you know you've got the best surgeon in the world. Right. Why, why do you need to go to a hospital? I'm like, well, I don't, I don't know. I have to fly in a few days. This doesn't seem okay. Yeah. And I called my surgeon in the U.S. the next morning who was flabbergasted and aghast. And he said, he did what? You know, and he, and he said, why didn't, you know, why aren't you at a hospital? And, you know, I, Paulo got on the phone with him and kind of assured him. And then my doctor actually said, you know, he probably saved you because if you had flown... You know, it sounds like the infection was so bad. If you had gotten back on a plane, if that burst on the plane, God knows what would have happened. Wow. So for me, that just cemented my trust in him. You know, I mean, he had, he had basically saved my life. And, you know, I don't know if it was that drastic, but he had definitely saved me from, you know, what could have been a horrible ordeal. Or, yeah. yeah, an emergency mm-hmm. happening. Yeah. And again, he seemed so caring, you know, and mm-hmm. he seemed so confident and so assured and so worried about me you know so it just and again this is 
early in the relationship within the first six months, I just had immense trust, you know? I mean, this was someone I trusted implicitly. Oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, especially after that, I mean, really, what can this guy not do? Do you feel like your love for him grew after after this? Oh, or yeah. It was just, you're just... I mean, I just, you just kind of, I just kind of threw myself into him. Yeah. You know? When, like, when wow. I say I trusted him implicitly, here's this man yeah. who's been there for me while my ex is dying. And I said this to friends many times. I Nobody could ever step into her dad's shoes. I never could, never will. But he really seemed, and I, I actually said to myself, you know, John would approve of him. You know, yeah. this is somebody that as best as someone can, you know, he, he can fill that role, you know, and I really thought he was the perfect guy for us. And he promised us both. Mm-hmm. You never have to worry about anything again. I'm going to take care of both of you oh. forever. He called us his, his princesses, you know, I'm going to take care of my princesses forever. You never have to worry about anything ever again. And I believed him. <sighs> yeah. Wow. So it wasn't much later than this that he proposed. Mm-hmm right? Christmas of 2013. Yeah. And he yeah. just hands you a box. Yeah. I mean, the proposal was so sweet because things were so extravagant always and over the top. Um, and we had a very quiet little Christmas. It was just the three of us at home. I love Christmas. It's my favorite holiday. And, mm-hmm. you know, this was all very new to him. And he said he'd never wrapped a gift before for Christmas. I was like, oh, what? really? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, we, you know, we were just at home. He cooked. We had the music playing. And we, you know, I always have this huge tree that's you know dripping with ornaments and he we were exchanging gifts very casually like we we're dressed in sweats and pajamas yeah. or whatever and he pulls out a little box and he hands it to me and i'm thinking nothing of it and, and i he's opened, filming this right yeah and i guess my first i i should have picked up on something because he pulled out a bottle of dom perignon and i was like oh we're, oh, fancy. Wow, we're, yeah. fan- <laughs> we're fancy this christmas mm, huh? yeah. and my daughter was kind of giggly i would find out later she was in on it but wow. i didn't know and um as I'm opening the box, you know, they're both kind of giggling and I open it and it's a, a ring, a gorgeous ring. And I just kind of, and he was videotaping and I kind of looked at him. And I'm like, is this what I think it is? And he just nodded. Um, so he never got down on like, one no. Knee. And that was actually funny. Cause I, he just nodded and I just, you know, I was shocked. I mean, I literally was speechless. My mouth drops open on the mm-hmm. video. I'm just like, yeah. you know, I can't talk. And it was beautiful. And it was beautiful in the simplicity of the moment and the, was it felt so genuine you know um my daughter la- later gave him a very hard time she said that's not how you propose you have to get yeah, down on one right, yeah. he said, she said i don't think you even asked the question you know yeah will you marry me <laughs> yeah. just as a nod um but you it knew was, it seemed and you yeah. can tell in the video that you knew yeah. what that it was meant. more of a promise of marriage at the time because he said he had filed for divorce but the divorce oh. hadn't hadn't gone Couldn't through legally, yet. Legally, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, and he would later propose maybe two or three more times and actually get down on one knee oh, and did. officially okay. propose. But it was more of an intention to marry. But that's mm-hmm. when we got engaged. And it was it was really beautiful, you know? Yeah. And it was really beautiful because it was so simple and sweet mm-hmm. and genuine, or seemed to be. Yeah. And it was a beautiful ring. Yes, it was. Except for he told you well, it was Well, he worth told me quite he, a bit. Yeah, he told me he had paid $100,000 for this ring and it was handcrafted in Italy, which seemed exorbitant to me, mm-hmm. but okay, why would he lie about it? And all these little yeah. diamonds. Was there a brand or anything on it? No, because like, it was handmade and oh, it, was, okay. it was custom made for me. So uh, some local jeweler and... Mm. I mean, it said whatever it was, 22 karat gold or whatever it was inside, you know, but um, I would later found out find out that it was worth about $1,000, <laughs> Yeah, um, that's just crazy. I mean, the clip too of the uh, um, appraiser, oh, the right? Yeah, yeah. 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 And he's, <laughs> he just starts laughing when you tell him how much. Like he, he told you it was how much. Yeah, he's like, that clip is was it crazy. was it actual diamonds on there? Or was it? Yeah, like, yeah. they were, it, and it was gold. It it wasn't fake. It just wasn't. The worth quality as much. wasn't yeah. what it. No, what it wasn't worth. Like anywhere claiming. close to what he claimed it was worth. So at the time, did you feel like things were moving quickly, or did they feel about right? It felt a little fast, but because it was sort of a promise of marriage, it didn't, yeah. you know, it didn't feel as fast. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was head over heels in love with him. Totally. You know, at the time, I knew I wanted to spend the rest of my life with him. You know, he had said that to me many times. He said that to my daughter. So it, it just felt kind of organic, you know. Oh, right. Mm. But then he, he's a very, very busy man. So he's off, you know, he holds all yeah. these positions around the world. And so how, how much did you see him? after that like what was like the average we saw amount of time each other a lot actually i yeah. mean he was in new york i would say once a month you know okay. at okay. least and he would stay at least four or five days sometimes a week 
Mm-hmm. Um, and when and then he was flying me on different, you know, a lot of times if he was somewhere, he would fly me in, you know, for a weekend or whatever. So thing. you go to him. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we saw each other a lot, you know, and we talked all day long every day. Okay. So it, even though it was long distance, you still felt like very connected. Yeah, very connected. He loves his video messages, huh? Yes. How many of those do you think you got sent from him? Like, God, at least 50, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he would record these little love, <laughs> love messages, we'll I call them. We'll see if we can them. play some. Good morning, my love. I, um, I am with uh, Igor. I'm eating a salad and... Um, I cannot stop thinking at you and just wanted to wish you a beautiful Sunday morning and day and um, tell you how much I love you and how much I want you, desire you, want to be mine and want to live with you and die with you. I love you. Bye. I would just, you know me he loved me he missed me and or Which whatever is, i mean yeah. so sweet i mean it's like yeah yeah very sweet you know who doesn't want to get messages like that right. from from that person and and so how soon after you got engaged did you guys like start talking like wedding plans and we'll let's let's go ahead and get into that because that's where this this really starts to yes, take off <laughs> yeah 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 we waited um the special that we had done on and it wasn't really on Paula, it was more on Hannah, but obviously Paula's yeah. a big part of the story. The special that we did, it sat on the shelf for a long time, but it finally aired in, it was I think it was June of 2014. And I wanted to wait until it was aired before we became official, and certainly before we started telling people that we wanted to get married. Um, and so that aired, and then we picked a date. We picked the date July 15th of 2015, and we sent out a save the date for the wedding, and started planning the wedding. And Paolo told me he wanted a big Catholic wedding in Italy. You know, he grew up in Italy, and his mother was still in Italy. He talked about his mother all the time. She lives near Florence, and he said he wanted to get married somewhere in Tuscany. And he actually flew me and my daughter to Italy, and we went and looked at different places to get married. We met with a wedding planner. Um, we met his mother. We went to his mother's house, and... She cooked us homemade gnocchi. We had this lovely afternoon sitting in the kitchen with his mother. Wow. She cooks for us. She pulls out the family photo albums mm-hmm. and she's showing wow. me pictures of young Paolo and Paolo and his dad. And, you know, I mean, everything seems so real. I talked to his sister on the phone that day um, and she was all excited about the wedding. In hindsight, his mother speaks not a word of English. I don't speak a word of Italian, you know. So um, Paolo's translating? Yeah, so he's okay. translating. When we left, she was crying, tears streaming down her face. She's embracing me like wow, hard as wow. hell. My daughter, there are pictures of him embracing me, embracing my daughter. Um, after we left the house, he took us to the cemetery, to his father's grave, you know. In hindsight, I'm thinking, what in the hell did he tell that woman? You know, I mean, I, the only thing I can think of, because I'm a very affectionate person, and, and not like we were making out in front of her, but we were, you know, yeah. holding hands and, you know, arm, it was very clear that we were together, at least to me, but because she was crying, I mean, I can laugh about it now, but I, I don't, he must have told her that either I was his patient or my daughter was his patient or we both oh. were his patients. I mean, maybe we were both dying. Maybe that's why oh, she was wow. crying. Oh, I can't think wow. of anything else. What else could he have told the woman? You but know? She would be that emotional. Yeah. You think maybe she was just grateful that her son had found love? Maybe. Was it that kind I don't of know. crying? It seemed like she felt bad for you? Maybe. I don't know. I, I just don't know. I don't know what that poor wow, woman that's knew. Interesting. But this is one of the things when people say to me, you know, how did you believe this? I mean, he flew us to Italy. Yeah. He paid for everything. We sat in his mother's house. She showed yeah. us photo albums. Yeah. She made this homemade meal for us. She was crying. I mean, who wouldn't believe yeah, who that? who wouldn't believe it? I mean, really, it's strange that people even have the nerve to say that to you because I think anyone what there's no reason not to believe it I mean he's showing you everything you're living it every day so yeah. especially meeting like his family yeah and getting that close like, yeah that just doesn't happen in every story like the no where, and know. his his sister he had one sister her daughter was going to be our flower girl you know I emailed back and forth with a sister now in hindsight I'm thinking was that him under mm-hmm. some fake email Huh. You know, could have been. Wow. I mean, I sent a flower girl dress to some address in Italy. I don't know where that dress went, you know. But <laughs> oh my God. Do you know for sure that that was his mom that you were with? Like, 
would you have any way to verify that other than I'm pretty sure it was his mom. It seemed, yeah. seemed that way. I mean, way. they had yeah. the photo albums. I mean, everything. the name, would be like the a lot photo of work. albums. Also I mean, say, that, was, that would take a hell of a lot of work, <laughs> <Yeah>. actually. <laughs> this is my fake mother. Yeah. <laughs> Some random woman in Tuscany. Somebody, though, that was convinced. I bet she was an actress. I'm like, that's just way too much work. Yeah. That's... To get the photo albums, to get the name on the, you know, on the yeah. name plate yeah. on the door. I don't know. That's just When would he just... have time to do that, right. too? Like, wow. Wow. Do you yeah. think she actually knew that you guys were I don't going know. to? Well, I guess yeah. You I don't, just know, don't know because yeah, the language barrier. You have no idea I what she knew. Know. Wow. So he's obviously trying to get this divorce, and are, yeah, I'm so assuming we, we go, we look at some places, and then I come, we come back to New York, and I um, move into a different job um, at NBC, and I'm really busy, like like mm. crazy busy, and my job started very early in the morning, and I was totally overwhelmed, and Paulo says to me, look. You're so overwhelmed. Let me take over. I want you to let me take over the wedding planning. And I, of course, said, he does. Yeah, and uh, very convenient in hindsight. It was mm-hmm. very a very clever, calculated move. Yeah. And because at first I was like, "What do you mean?" You know, he said, "Well, look, yeah. you know, I'll find the place for us to get married in Italy. Yeah. You know, you don't have time to travel to Italy, and I want to surprise you with everything. You know, and I I want to plan the wedding. All I want you to do is find your dress and just show up looking beautiful. That's all you have to do." Mm. Which in a way sounded very romantic, yeah. but also for me as a producer, I mean, I'm I'm a control freak. I'm a yeah. producer, yeah. and I wrestled with this. And I I called my friends, I called my sister. I said, you know, what do I do? And they all said the same thing. They're like, you know what, Benita, for once in your life, just can you just let go? You know, this man loves you. You know, he's really good at surprising you. Yeah. You know, everything's going to be beautiful. Record. Let him surprise mm-hmm. you. Why not? Mm-hmm. You know, and so and he made me promise. He said, if you agree to this, you can't ask me any questions about anything. Mm. Very clever. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I finally, I said, okay, fine, I'll do it, you know? And so this was really smart on his part because now moving forward, you know, there were certain times I wanted to ask questions about things with the wedding and I didn't because I'd promised him I wouldn't. So now he takes over planning of the wedding. All I have to do is find the invitations, pick out the invitations and find my dress. Mm-hmm. And he sends me these texts and pictures. He's in Italy. I went to this place, that place, this, you know, church. And this goes on for at least a month, maybe longer. And he finally says, I'm, you know, it, it would be, oh, the priest won't marry us because, and I had said to him from the beginning, he said, I want to get married in a Catholic church. I said, well, how's that going to work? I'm not Catholic. Yeah. And I know enough to know that yeah. they don't marry divorcees in the Catholic church. You know, we mm-hmm. were both divorced or so I thought. <laughs> um, and I'm not even Catholic, you know, I was raised Episcopalian. I said, how, you know, how, How's I'll that gonna take work? care of it. I'm, yeah. I'm going to take care of it. Logistically how that's going to work. But then he yeah. starts telling me that all the priests he's talking to don't want to do this wedding and they won't marry us. And again, this is so slow, this slow, meticulous weaving of this web of lies. And it, mm-hmm. it wasn't like he just, you know, it, it goes on for months. And finally one day he calls and he says, well, this place won't marry us either. And I said, what, what are we going to do now? It's like coming up to October of, of 2014. And we've set the wedding date for July of 2015. It's not that much time, you know? And even yeah. though he's not allowing me to be involved in the day-to-day planning of the wedding, I know this window is shrinking yeah. and I'm starting yeah. to panic. I mean, I said, we have to send out invitations, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, look, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go call in a favor. I'm going to go and um, talk to my contacts in Rome. And uh, what? <laughs> my contacts in Had Rome. Had he ever mentioned Rome prior to this? Did he have so contact he had told me that he had done work at the Vatican before, and wow. that he had done work on the previous um, pope, the last pope that died, that did have a tracheotomy before he died. Oh, so that and lined he up. didn't say that he was his doctor or anything. He just said he had been called in to consult. Now, Paolo is a leading cardiothoracic surgeon. He's Italian. It makes sense yeah. that yeah. he would be consulted. That you know he would be yeah. called in to consult. Checks I out. had seen paperwork. There was a recommendation as part of what went to Illinois for Hannah's surgery that talked about the work that Paolo had done at the Vatican written by another doctor. So I had no reason to question this at all. Guys, we have all been there, staring at your closet, saying to yourself, I have nothing to wear. Now you can have Stitch Fix refresh your wardrobe just in time for fall. Stitch Fix is the best way to discover new styles and brands just for you. You can think of Stitch Fix as your style partner, Your stylist will learn about your tastes and collaborate with you on looks that you'll love. All you have to do is answer a few questions about where you typically like to shop, what you like to wear, and your price range, and they've got you covered with over a thousand brands and styles. And the best part is you can try your pieces on at home before you buy. You just keep what you love and send back the rest, plus shipping, returns, and exchanges are always 
free. You guys know I'm a huge fan of Stitch Fix. The stylist that I've been working with knows me so well. She always sends great picks for me. And I love how convenient it is. It just makes my life so much easier. I love that there's no subscription required. You simply order a refresh as needed or set it and forget it with regular seasonal fixes. You're completely in control. Right now, I'm having my stylist send me a lot of sweaters just in time for the colder weather. And I love that if you have something coming up, like an event or a trip or something, you can tell them what you're looking for and they will tailor your fix to that. So right now, Stitch Fix is offering our listeners $20 off their first fix at stitchfix.com slash mile higher. That's stitchfix.com slash mile higher for $20 off today. Stitchfix.com slash mile higher. So he says he's going to go and talk to his contacts at the Vatican and ask them if they will help us find a priest to marry us. Okay. It sounds a little yeah. crazy, but it also seems plausible, yeah. right? Could be. Like maybe they'll do him a favor or yeah, something like that. Yeah, that's what he said. Yeah. And maybe because of the work I've done for the Vatican, maybe mm-hmm. they'll help us out. Okay. So he goes to the Vatican, supposedly, and <laughs> this is where things You take, take a picture <laughs> ever from the Vatican? <laughs> <laughs> this is where things take a crazy, yeah. sharp turn and just into la-la land. He calls me and... I remember he was in this meeting for about four hours or so I thought, you know, and I'm thinking, what is he doing? You know, so he calls me, I'm at work and he asked me to leave my office and he says that, you know, and he's all kind of giggly, like a, a little kid, you know, and he says, I have, I have good news. I said, okay, great. And he said, <laughs> they agreed to help us. Um, they're going to find someone, you know, to help Marius. I said, that's, that's fantastic. Great. He said, but I, I have to tell you something else. So, what? And he said, well, I actually met with Pope Francis himself, and I, I'm, yeah, I'm making a face like that on the other end of the phone. I'm like, you're like, huh? Uh, what? You're joking, right? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and he said, and um, I know this sounds a little crazy, but he offered to marry us himself. And I'm like, what? You know? Stop. And I'm like, stop it. You know, I thought he was like pulling my leg. Right. I, I called, I called BS joke. on him. I'm like, and I was actually pissed off because I was really busy at work. And I'm like, oh, stop. Don't waste you know? my time. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and he's like giggling and he, you know like, no, he's going to marry us. And I'm like, ah, shut up. And I actually hung up the phone on him. I was so irritated with him. Then I go back to my desk and just out of curiosity, I literally type in to Google, does the Pope marry people? Because I'm thinking the Pope doesn't marry people. Yeah. And what pops up is a month earlier in September that year, the Pope had just married 20 couples at the Vatican. And these were all couples that were quote unquote living in sin. You know, they were divorced or had children out of wedlock or, you know, I think mm. one of one of the couples may have been gay. I can't remember now. But they were all, you know, quote unquote sinners. And I thought, oh, okay. And maybe this isn't as ridiculous a whole new as thing it sounds. For the Pope. Yeah. So then, you know, we talk again later that night, and he that's when he tells me that he has been for many years the Pope's private personal doctor and that this is very top secret information. And he hasn't told me before because he's not allowed to talk about it. Oh my gosh. And although it sounds crazy. It also sounds plausible, and he makes it sound plausible because mm-hmm. who else is going to be the Pope's private personal doctor? I said, okay. And he said, and because I'm the Pope's private personal doctor and because of the work I've done at the Vatican before, he really wants to help us. And keep in mind, this is this very progressive, forward-thinking Pope, not unlike, he was right. unlike any other Pope before. Yeah, he was, and yeah. he said he he kind of wants to use us, you know, in a way because mm-hmm. we're both divorced. He has been looking for, he says, a divorced couple that he could use as sort of the poster couple to marry publicly and show the world and the Catholic Church how serious he is about yeah. moving the church out of, you know, old, stale yeah. traditions. Yeah. And he said, we're the perfect couple to do that. And at the same time, he can help us. So that's why he wants to marry us. And I still had a lot of trouble with this. It took me a few to, I just, I said, this, mm-hmm. isn't, this is nuts. And I was the one saying to him, wait a minute. Do you understand how controversial this will be? Yeah. You know, and how headline making this will be? This yeah, is no small little thing we're talking right. about. It. This, this will is be on be a huge all the news. Story. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're talking about something really groundbreaking and radical. Yeah. And he said, well, that's why if you agree, and he's like, I'm going to give you, he's like, you have, he's giving us three days to think about this or something like that. He said, if you agree, this will be kept very tightly under wraps. It'll be so secretive. Nobody will know about it. It will not even be announced until the day of the wedding. He said, nobody can know about it. Our guests, nobody. Again, the perfect setup. And he said, people are going to have to sign non-disclosure agreements with NDAs that they won't talk about it if they do need to know about it. And this, because this will be very controversial. So over the course of, you know, four or five days, he convinces me that, and now it's not about our wedding anymore. 
he convinces me that this is something we need to do, that this will help open up the doors of the Catholic Church. And we've been kind of chosen as this couple to to do this. And it's not even about us and our love and our wedding anymore, that he's being asked to do this. And by, by virtue of being with him, I'm now being asked to do this. And maybe it doesn't matter to me, but it matters to a whole lot of people in the Catholic Church who would like the church to be more open. Mm-hmm. And so he convinces me basically that I kind of have an obligation to do this and that I should do this. Yeah. And that's what it felt like. Yeah. And I somewhat reluctantly agreed to do it because it was daunting to me and overwhelming. And I I was having kind of a panic attack envisioning what yeah, would come with all of this. Yeah. But he convinced me that this is something we needed to do. And so this is why now when, and I understand when people hear, oh, he told right. you the Pope was marrying you. Oh, are you out of your mind? Yeah. I, mean, yeah, I get it. How and, did you believe that? Yeah. And if I read that in a headline, I'd be like, what the hell? Yeah. You know, but it's not like he just woke up one day and no. said, hey, honey. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oops, guess what? The Pope's marrying us. <laughs> no. And I went, oh, okay. It just didn't happen like that. I mean, it was just, it took months of this buildup and mm-hmm. this, you know, and then it was presented to me in this way. Yeah. Where I almost couldn't say no. Yeah. And so now my life got crazy. Yeah. And I I think it totally makes sense. And I think anyone in that position would believe it. Why wouldn't you? Especially with everything else about him and his background. And it, it does seem It seemed check out. crazy, but it also seemed crazier that he would make it up. Right. Why would exactly. somebody make that up? Yeah. Why would somebody of his stature, somebody that works where he works, that does the work that he does, that's the super surgeon, oh. why would he make it up? So anytime I had a question in my head, I thought, no. No, exactly. That, that, yeah. That's just, a, why? Why? Yeah. Who would do that? Yeah. Well, it's like, doesn't he realize that would be like the downfall? Yeah, catastrophic yeah. for yeah. him. So it's like, why would he put himself in that position? Right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so I wonder wild. when he cooked up oh, the whole God. idea to do this too. Like at I what point no did he idea. like, you know what? I am going to convince her the Pope will marry you. Why the why go that far? Though? I have no. Why not just go in Tuscany no and get married I, I at a honestly church? I have somewhere. no idea. Yeah. I just, it's so absurd. Yeah. I don't know. Like, did he read that article about the, the same That's one that what I, I was wondering. up on I was Google? Like, mm. And go, oh, I bet you. Know? you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, things well, just then it get just goes crazy. Well, then, they, then things here. get crazy because now, so now um, everybody that's involved with the wedding on my end, which was just person that I'm getting the dress from, the people making the Mm -hmm. invitations, they literally signed legal agreements that said they will not talk about... He had those drawn up? I did. Oh, you did? Okay. Um, That said they they will not talk, you know... Can't talk about her... Yeah, it didn't even say the Pope in there. It just said that there's a lot of, you know, very top secret information. This is a high profile wedding. You you know, a lot of Mm -hmm. talk about it. I had picked out a dress that I loved, but now that the Pope's getting married, I'm like, oh, okay. And it was kind of a sexy dress. I'm like, well, I can't wear that. (laughs) Um, and so I asked the um, the woman at the dress shop if she could get in touch with the designer because I love the dress so much. Mm-hmm. And Matthew Christopher, this who's now one of my best friends, yeah. lovely, lovely guy. Who, he seems so great. He's he's the best. Um, he grew up on a pig farm in Iowa, and wow. then and but had always loved designing dresses and had become you know was an up and coming designer. And so I had this meeting with him, and they actually signed the non disclosure agreement before the meeting without even knowing why they were signing this thing. Yeah. And we had this meeting and he's asking me these questions. Yeah. Trying to figure out what a big Italian is. wedding. I'm like, oh, I need to tell you something. And you know, their mouths are on the on the floor. But now Matthew gets very involved in this because mm-hmm. now he has to z- design some dress that's appropriate for the Pope. And then this turns into this four day insane, extravagant, you know, I don't even know what to call it, you know, it was like the wedding of the century. It was like yeah, Princess Diana like the royal or something. Wedding. Paolo kept adding events. You know, like the wedding was on a Saturday, but there was going to be a big red carpet event on Friday night for all our guests. Oh and God. there was going to be an event Friday, Thursday night, and there was going to be a, a thing on Sunday. So I needed four different dresses. So Matthew's now designing these couture wow. custom dresses for me. And he's, he's got to be so excited to be part of this. He was thrilled. I mean, this is huge for him. Oh, you yeah. Know? Huge. Oh, and he yeah. invested so much time in this. Yeah. And then the invitations, you know, now we are looking for, we got these really elaborate, mm-hmm. very expensive invitations. Yeah, they invitations were gorgeous. are crazy. I mean, they they came in this box that was like this thick and they were hand bound in lambskin leather. They were oh, beautiful. Yeah. But now, so first it's a Pope and then one by one. And again, this would happen over the course of, it would be sort of one thing every three weeks. Yeah. Um, the first thing Paula told me was that Andrea Bocelli was going to sing for me in the church because Andrea Bocelli's mother and his mother are very close. Of course. <laughs> okay. 
That's wow. nice. That's kind of amazing. And then it was this big event we're having Friday before the wedding. Elton John is going to perform at the wedding. What's interesting about that, that was I had, I was really wrestling to not check anything, but that was one of the things I did. I'm like, Elton John, really? So, but I, I Google and Elton John is performing in Rome at this place that weekend. So oh my I'm like, gosh. okay. It, so he it, obviously knew that when he told you. Clearly. To but that to me yeah. made it seem real. And then it's, he just kept, sorry, he just kept adding people. So it was, I'm trying to even remember who else. John Legend was going to play piano at some point. At the, Which he I does play private, private yes, events. Yes, and he yeah. knew that I loved John Legend. And you can, he if doesn't. you have enough money, you can get these people yeah. at yeah. private yeah. events. It mm-hmm. is, it's not, you know, it sounds ridiculous to some people, but, you know, celebrities do it all the time. People yeah. with money do this all the time. You know, you mm-hmm. can get these kind of people to play at your event, at your wedding. Yeah, and for such a big event like this, exactly. it just made sense. If the Pope's there, then everybody else is going to show <laughs> yeah. up, right? Uh, well, and then because it's it. the Pope, now all these dignitaries are being invited. You know, he's like, we have to invite these world leaders and all this. And because, you know, and it, it was head spinning. So, I mean, we literally had invitations made up to Andrea Bocelli, John Legend, Elton John. Somebody else was in there. I can't even remember now who. who um, Russell Crowe. Uh, Russell, yeah, Which, randomly Russell Crowe. <laughs> yeah. He said he had done. <laughs> so this is the other thing that comes out after this is that the Pope isn't his only private personal patient. He's part of this secret network of doctors around the world that cater to world leaders and celebrities. And it's all top secret. Nobody can talk about it. And that these people have private doctors, you know, and that they don't want anyone to know about. And mm-hmm. it's it's doctors from different different specialties. He's a cardiothoracic surgeon, and they cater to these they celebrities. Like a network, interesting. Now, listen, I have a friend in LA who's friends with a lot of you know A list celebrities, and she just, when I told her that, she just she's like, yeah, the people they do it yeah. all the time. This yeah. is a normal thing. It so, makes total sense. You know, like, yeah. okay, and you know, why they, wouldn't he be part of that? Exactly. You know, somebody has to do it. Why not him? Yeah. And he made it all sound very real. So then he it comes out that, so Russell Crowe was on the guest list because he said he'd done work for either Crowe or somebody in Russell Crowe's family. I don't remember. Then the Obamas. He says that he's done work on, on Obama. The Clintons. He claims <sighs> to be like best friends with Bill Clinton. There were people, the Sarkozy's from France. I don't, there were so many. I don't remember. George Clooney? No. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't get an invite. He would be like, you have to compete with him then. That wouldn't be. That might have been been the the one one that gives it all. Argued about. So we literally have wedding invitations made out to these people. I mean, that's how crazy. So you're getting addresses. You're getting figuring out where they're going. The 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 people like that, the celebrities, and the it all it would just it just said, you know, his honorable whatever, Mm -hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Bill Clinton, whatever it said. It didn't have an address. Paulo said that these he was going to hand deliver. Okay. All the ones to yeah. the celebrities and to the dignitaries he was going to hand deliver. Okay. So when does the, he have time right? to do this? Well, the one we argued about was um, because he was doing a clinical trial in Russia. He said he had to invite Putin. I'm like, right. I'm, I don't want effing Putin at my wedding. I'm yeah. sorry. What? Oh my God. And also, P.S., you're inviting the Obamas and the Clintons and Putin. Nah, that's not going to happen, you know? <laughs> that, yeah. um, in what world would that happen? You never, yeah. right? And, and, which is another thing people say, you believe that. I did, actually didn't believe that. But he said, well, I have to, it's a cursory invitation. We have to invite him. Somebody won't yeah. come. Okay, fine. But now this thing has turned into. Yeah, this is like a night for the century. Like, you this know, is literally a, the wedding of the century. Yeah. You know? I must have and, felt so nervous. Well, so this is the thing. As this is, I have so much anxiety now because all this attention and all this, and it's going to be, and I know, and again, I'm being told this is not going to get leaked until the day of the wedding, but clearly there's going to be press all over this. And paparazzi, he, paparazzi, be, yeah. and he comes in one day and announces to me that he's arranged for the equivalent of Vanity Fair in Italy, whatever the name of the magazine is, to cover me exclusively from the moment I land in Italy. And I said, "When were you going to ask me if I want if I was okay with that?" You know, he's like, "They're going to be following you every," you know. And that's when I actually had a kind of like full on panic attack. We were in Chicago. He was speaking at a conference and. He told me that on a Friday night. He got up Saturday morning and went to the conference. And when he came back, I was in bed crying. And I said, I can't, this is too much for me. I can't, I'm totally overwhelmed. I don't want this. You know, I, I want to help you. I want to help the Pope, but I just, I want, I would go marry you on a beach. Yeah. And again, very, very clever. He literally drops down on his knees next to the bed. He's stroking my head and he's, okay, forget it. We'll call the whole thing off. If you can't do this, we won't do it. We don't have to do this, you know? So he then he makes me feel bad. 
you know? Yeah. And wow. to the point that I said, it's okay. I'll get it together. It's okay. We, we can still do it, you know? Just crazy. Crazy, it's crazy. It's so weird because he could have, like, really gotten out of it all at that moment. Exactly. He could have made you not feel guilty and said, you know what? I'm thinking, I'm feeling the same exactly. way, honey. Let's just go get married. And this is this is turning into more I than I ever wanted. Could have all been over right I then. I know. But I think he was so caught up in the rush of it, you know? You almost wonder if he started believing his own lies or the fantasy yeah, was so intriguing to him that he didn't want to give it up. I think so. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I that just if can't he just imagine. speaks it into, you know, <laughs> yeah. into the universe, it's just going to manifest. And then yeah. there were so many other things. I mean, I didn't, I wouldn't find out some of this till later because there were all these surprises. But, you know, he had meetings with Matthew Christopher and Matthew's then husband, you know, going over all these details about how I was going to be in a carriage with the Pope and there was going to be fireworks on the lake. And there was another ring that he was going to give me. He was always giving me more rings. And there was, so many like the details and, and and the text that I have, if I can tell you he, thousands of them where he went into minute detail about he'd gone to food tastings and wine tastings and, you know, about this, this famous restaurant in Florence that he had, you know, arranged to cater the wedding and meetings he was having supposedly with the Swiss guard and security at the vet, you know, yeah, I was going to ask you about that. How yeah, they've... tons. There were tons of meetings about security yeah. plans and this, and, you know, all the different dignitaries had sent in their, security people and this is going to be closed off and there's going to be snipers on the roof here and this, that, oh and the other God. thing. But the, the detail is nuts. De detail about his mother. You know, my mother cried when she got the invitation and, you know, and she's so excited about her dress. And I mean, I, I went back and read them recently and it's just mind blowing. Like he's you know, really creative. Yeah. He, the storytelling. <laughs> and creativity. Yeah. It really yeah. is. The fantasy, the imagination is nuts. But just and even the time it would have taken to write these texts, yeah. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so effusive about how amazing our wedding is going to be. One of the texts that I think is so telling is, and it was towards the end, right before I figured everything out. He talked about how this wedding and all the people that were coming, how much it meant to him and his reputation, and this is validation that you know I am who I say I am, or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. So somewhere in there, this was about him and his ego and things falling apart. And he knew, I think, that things were about to blow up and fall apart. And I don't know, maybe somehow this crazy fantasy was making him feel like he was okay and he was who he was supposed yeah. to be. I don't know. Yeah. Wow. It, yeah, it's just hard to understand, understand yeah. the end result here. Because again, you're, you know, you have your wedding party. You've got all these people flying to Italy for the wedding. How many guests total? Like three? We had almost... 300 guests wow. coming oh. from all over the world. Keep in mind, I'm from Australia. So I had family flying from Australia. We, I forget that I counted the countries at one point, but it was over 10, you oh know. And gosh. he let this thing go so far that, and he claimed he had rented out a castle for our closest friends and family to stay. And I mean, we sat at a dinner one night and there were about 20 people there and he gave a speech about this castle that he'd rented and how he couldn't wait for everybody to come to the wedding. And he was paying for everybody to stay in the castle for three days. And everybody was like, what? I mean, what? everybody was so excited about this yeah. wedding. I mean, it was like yeah. palpable. People mm -hmm. couldn't wait to come to this wedding. Most people, very few people knew about the Pope. You know, they just knew that it was this big celebrity studded A-lister a wedding. And our, the wedding invitation itself had instructions about, you know, you need a password. You can't get in without this invitation. And everybody knew something mm -hmm. big was going on, but they didn't know to what level. But everybody was so excited. You know, it's yeah. Italy. Yeah. You yeah. know, everybody has to get red carpet attire, you know, wow. for the Friday night thing. Mm -hmm. So he lets people buy all these fancy gowns and tuxes and whatever, Ugh. buy plane tickets, book hotels. All these people, including my own family, he oh lets it go God. that far. Ugh. He lets me, because we were supposed to move to Barcelona after the wedding. That was the plan. You know, he has this house in Barcelona. Yeah. Yeah. He lets me pull my daughter out of her very, she'd been in this private school in Brooklyn that schools mm -hmm. in Brooklyn are yeah, held to get into. In yeah. Yeah. And she'd been there since kindergarten. He lets me pull her out of the school. I tell the school we're moving to Barcelona. Ugh. I decide to quit my job. He lets me quit my job. He lets all of this happen. He sits in front of my daughter, you know, talking to her about the school he's enrolled her in in Barcelona and the life she's going to live in Barcelona and this, that, and the Thank other thing. God, He just, you know, he takes it that far. Ah, he just doesn't even think about the consequences. Doesn't even think about the end results, or he does and doesn't care. And that's one like, or the other. 
Wow. I just don't see how that. I can't stop saying wow. It's how just does that so benefit unbelievable. him in the end? I don't know. How, that that's the mystery here. I don't and know. Like, how does this? So the help only him? thing at the end that was in the last like two months before I finally figured it out, we were fighting a lot, and we were fighting because this man had flown me all over the world. You know, all these beautiful romantic vac- vacations. He's never taken me to the house in Barcelona. Every single time we were supposed to go to Barcelona, he had a last minute emergency surgery he had to do. And the trip got canceled. Of course. Of course. But we were fighting about it because I said, who marries a man without seeing the house where they're going to live, mm-hmm. you know, and who moves and quits their job and pulls their child out of school. And I haven't seen the house where I'm going to No. And also I hadn't met his children yet. Mm-hmm. I was a little more forgiving about that, though, because I, you know, they're grown and obviously with divorces being complicated. Yeah. You want to like force it. And, no. Yeah, and yeah. that one I was yeah, a little willing to work with, but we were clashing heads big time about Barcelona. And I basically gave him an ultimatum. I said, I'm not marrying you until I see this house in Barcelona. And so we were fighting about that a lot. Um, and which is interesting in hindsight, because he was, I think he was stuck. He was starting to get stuck because now it was, yeah. the window was closing, you know, and things were getting way too real. Even and deep. I was also starting to ask a lot of questions I wanted to talk to the wedding planner. You know, mm-hmm. you can't talk to the wedding planner. Maria, her name was supposedly. Why not? You know, well, everything's yeah, a surprise. Not? Well, she knows what she can tell me and what yeah. she can't. I mean, you know, I said there are certain her. things I need to know. You know, I, he wouldn't give me the name of the castle where all our guests were staying. I'm like, this is getting ridiculous. Just, you know, people castle. need to know what the name of the castle is and how are they getting yeah. from the airport to the can- ca- castle. I mean, we're talking now we're within two months of the wedding. So it was just oh. things were starting to nag, really nag at me, but not in the way where I would say he's lying. Mm-hmm. It's just something felt, you know, you could feel something off. was off. So at what point did he tell you that you guys would be able to take communion at the wedding? I don't remember when that was, but at some point as he's telling me about all these celebrities and dignitaries, you know, he announces not only to me, but also to Matthew, who's gay and Catholic, mm-hmm. that um, we are going to be allowed to take communion at the wedding, that this is another part of the Pope's, you know, sending yeah. a message to the world that two divorcees are going to be able to take communion in the Catholic Church for yeah. the first time. be a big deal. And he sits in front of Matthew and his husband and tells them that they, as a gay couple, married couple, are also going to be able to take communion in and the he, church. he told them that to their He faces? told them that. Oh. Matthew started crying. Dude. It's Matthew. a huge deal. It's Ma- huge. Matthew yeah. was so emotional. Matthew had had a hard time coming out as gay yeah. to his family. Yeah. You know, this was had been so difficult for him. And to, to Matthew, this meant acceptance. This mm. meant that he was finally going to be accepted. And Paolo sat there with him for hours when Matthew's crying and getting so emotional. It's just, it's Looney Tunes. But he loves that. He loves that power over people yes. that he can he can have something that you need or you, yes. he's supplying you with something that's so God complex. Ah, yeah. He's the savior. Unbelievable. He's the savior. Yeah, he's here to save everybody, save apparently. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, exactly. everybody. No, exactly. He'll find something. His patients, his me, my yeah. daughter, you Everyone know, Everyone he whoever. comes in contact with, it yes. seems like he finds a way Exactly. To he's save the big them. hero. Yeah, he's the hero. Imagine if that really did happen. It would have been such, like you said, oh, come on, such come a you huge, huge story. Yeah, huge story. It would be trending worldwide. Everywhere. Wow. Would be cool. I it wish that be. was true. I know. So at this point, you're really feeling like the wedding's probably going to move forward, but you're starting to kind of feel... I didn't think that the wedding wasn't going to happen, but yeah. I was. we were fighting a lot. Like I, yeah. I was getting... And something about him was changing. Um, and I... In the backdrop of this, which we didn't talk about in November of 2014, so seven, eight months before our wedding date, it comes out that there are allegations against him in um, Sweden at Mm -hmm. Karolinska of scientific Mm -hmm. misconduct. Right. And he's being investigated for scientific misconduct. And everything kind of changed, shifted from then. Mm. Um, I was very angry about it because he hadn't told me about it. And this investigation had been going on for months. And I said, why in the hell haven't you told me about this? You know, and he, you know, his excuse was, well, you know, with the wedding planning and everything, I didn't want to upset you and it's fine. It's all, Mm -hmm. you know, false allegations and everything will be fine. But it blew up. It was Thanksgiving weekend and it blew up in the news. You know, there were headlines, it was in the New York Times and the phone was ringing off the hook. And I spent that entire weekend. We had flown out to California that weekend to, um, he actually wanted to formally ask my dad for my hand in marriage, which he did that weekend. Um, And my brother also lives in California and we spent Thanksgiving with 
them. But I spent most of the weekend holed up in the hotel room with him fielding press requests and answering them. I mean, his English, especially written, was not that good. So I'm the one typing the responses and defending him, you know, and I think I'm doing what any loving partner should yeah. do. I'm defending my man and yeah. I'm, you know, and he claims he's being, you know, unfairly maligned and attacked and, you know, going back to what he told me from the beginning that he had these enemies. Mm -hmm. And so the charges are dropped at one point in early 2015, but then somebody comes back, if I'm remembering the timeline, I don't remember exactly now, but the investigation is started up again and it's even more heated. Um, and he changed. He was very, very tense. He was very depressed. I'd never seen him like that. He was, he was very worried about his career and kept saying that this could end his career and this could be the end of everything. And um, so there was a lot of tension just in general between us. And this was all kind of building, you know. The allegations that he explained. He pointed the finger at one colleague in particular who he said just had a vendetta against him mm -hmm. and was jealous. And here's the thing, in the pr professional scientific world, my dad's a physicist. This is very common. There's a lot of professional yeah. jealousy. There's a lot of competition to get papers published, to get money for grants. So this is not unusual. And my dad even said to me, you know, Ben, it happens all the time. You know, it's unfortunate, but my dad believed it too, you know, and I believed him. This is kind of a strange question, but do you think it's at all possible that he chose you because of your background in journalism? A hundred percent. You think, he, yeah, a hundred percent. He saw you as maybe a tool 100%. to help. Yeah, wow. I think... And I don't know at what point that was decision was made, maybe from day one. Wow. You know, like maybe he knew this was gonna maybe come up something and... clicked with him in that when we were sitting on that plane, or maybe it happened even before then. I don't know. Yeah. But I think he thought, yeah, that I could be his ally. I mean, and look, I was sit I sat in that hotel room with him yeah. for a weekend fielding and answering press requests and you know, I'm a good writer, you mm -hmm. know. And I, you know, I knew how to write the emails in a way that would convince people that he was innocent and I did it, you know, and I think he wanted me in his back pocket. And yeah. maybe also part of the allure, I think, was, and it's sick, but I think it's the thrill of, of doing it to me. You know, here yeah. I am, this award-winning network television producer, mm -hmm. Emmy award-winning mm -hmm. producer, mm -hmm. and there's some kind of sick thrill in pulling this and pulling my friends and my colleagues and everybody else that believed it. I really think he gets some kind of sick high out of it you know, of, of getting away with it. And then I think it, I think that's why things just kept escalating and escalating. Oh, wow. They believe this. And I don't know how conscious or unconscious that is, but yeah. there has to be some of that going on. Yeah. And just kind of up the ante a little yeah. bit each time to the point where maybe he realized like, oh shit. Well, like, he dug himself into a yeah. crazy hole. How do I get out of this yeah. one? Like, yeah. I can't just write a text and <laughs> this all goes yeah. away. Uh -huh. you know? Well, like, that's I, like the, the hardest part about all of this to wrap your mind around is what was his end game well, what did still, he think was gonna you know, happen because i'm the one that ended up and i guess we should backtrack and tell that part but yeah you know that is the big money question how in the hell did he think he was getting out of this i yeah. have no idea you're just gonna have all these people show up i have no idea to what to the mystery castle that think, doesn't exist i think the only thing i can think of if it had gone that far that people actually showed up in italy i think there would have been some last minute oh yeah threat oh my God, there's been a threat on the Pope's life or, you know, on the dignitaries <laughs> yeah. or something. We can't do this. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, so, I'm so sorry. Something. But even then, now I'm there, right? At that point, I've left my job. I pulled my daughter out of school. Totally. I have my wedding dress. What was he going to do with me? Yeah. You know, I would find out soon, soon that he never actually got divorced. So he never could have legally married me in the first place. So he, what was he going to do with me? I don't, I don't know. I don't know if he had a plan. I think they just kind of go you know, by the seat of their pants, one step at a time. And because these con artists usually get away with it somehow, mm -hmm. somehow they wiggle their way out of it. And he had been for so long. I can only imagine that somehow he thought, somehow I'm going to get I'll out. I'll figure it out. Yeah. I'll figure it out. So another thing, another lie, he was relearning the piano at the time, right? So just like the dancing. So suddenly Paolo tells me that he's taking piano lessons in Russia, that he had taken piano when he was a little boy and he'd given it up. And now he was, he wanted to learn to play piano again so he could play piano for me at the wedding. Mm -hmm. Another very romantic gesture, right? Mm -hmm. And so I buy him for Christmas or birthday or something, this keyboard to keep in my apartment in New York so that he can practice the piano. Mm. Whenever he was practicing the piano, he had headphones on like you guys do. 
because I wasn't allowed to hear what he was playing because it was a secret for the wedding. Oh. And so he was always in there playing the piano, practicing. And one time I had videotaped him playing the piano and I was kind of tiptoeing around the corner and I had videotaped him and then I kind of tiptoed back. And I never even looked at the tape because I just, I wasn't supposed to be watching. Yeah, why would you, yeah. So fast forward to after I find out he's literally lying about everything, which we'll come back to. I want to get rid of everything that has anything to do with him, including the keyboard. So I put it on Craigslist to sell it. And this woman shows up to buy the keyboard. And for some reason, we hit it off and mm-hmm. we became friends. And she's actually now one of my very, very best friends. I'm actually oh, her baby's cool. godmother. Wow. Um, well, that's kind of it a is. cool thing that yeah. came out of this. But she, we went on vacation about three months later and um, she's funny. She's sort of very proper and English and she's, we were driving. I was driving. She's like, Benita, I have to tell you something. And I said, what? And she oh. said, you know that piano I bought from you? I'm like, yeah, what? She's like, um, do you know it can play itself? <laughs> and I said, what in the hell do you mean it can play itself? She's like, it has pre-recorded music on it. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. You mean he was lying about that too? <laughs> so now I go back to this videotape. This is funny. And I had never noticed this before, but at, you know, he's got his back to me and I'm videotaping and he's playing the piano. At the very end of this little video clip, he lifts his damn hands off the piano and he's dusting the top of it yeah. and the music is still playing. It's the wildest <laughs> thing to see it like. I'm like, even the piano playing was fake. So he what didn't know hell? you were taking that no. clip. Oh, I was always curious. Why would no, he, he have no idea? That's why I was right tiptoeing there. and that's why I had never looked at it. You know? Oh, okay. And so just you- thinking about <laughs> the fact that this man, this world renowned surgeon sitting down at this, this keyboard <laughs> going, playing the all piano. right, <laughs> start. <laughs> and it's just, just playing so it's so, like unbelievable. He might have been trying at some point, but he certainly didn't know yeah, how to play. Yeah. Like, you know. No, so maybe like... that was his plan for the wedding to have a pre recorded song oh, maybe. and just to like <laughs> look really good. <laughs> maybe got the skill down of Well, well John Legend's the hand there. I don't think John yeah, Legend's gonna get that buy past that. John. Uh-uh. Yeah. With the holidays right around the corner, it's not too late to get your holiday mailing and shipping under control with stamps.com. Sign up now and you'll be printing your own postage in minutes. If you've ever been to the post office during the holiday season, pretty much every time I've gone, there's a line out the door, at least 20 people. Well, with Stamps.com, they're your one-stop shop for all your shipping and mailing needs. For more than 20 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses, including mine. Get access to the USPS and UPS services you need to run your business right from your computer. No lines, no traffic, and no hassle. Even save money with major discounts on USPS and UPS shipping rates up to 86% off. Huge savings there. Stamps.com is a stress-free solution for every small business. You can print your postage wherever you do business and all you need is a computer and a printer. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard, which is amazing. Rates are constantly changing with Stamps.com switch and save feature. You can easily compare carriers and rates so you know you're getting the best deal every time. And if you're running an online store, Stamps.com works seamlessly with all major shopping carts and marketplaces. We use Shopify and Stamps.com plugs in perfectly. This holiday season, trade late nights for silent nights and get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code MILEHIRE for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. There's no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code MILEHIRE. I guess we should start with how you found out. Well, um, the day after I left my job, um, I had very mixed feelings about leaving, you know. Um, yeah. I loved my job, you know. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, if he was at the height of his career when I met him, I was at the height of mine, you know. And I loved it. I'd been there for, you know, over a decade. I, I absolutely loved my job, you know. Mm-hmm. And I never in a million years mer- imagined that I would leave a job for a man you know i'm very independent i mm-hmm. always have been and it's just not even in my you know so for me to be doing that and also to be you know i was embarking on this whole new life i was giving up everything yeah. everything was at stake you know i was leaving my job i was going to move to barcelona 
um, kind of mm. riding off into the sunset with him, but also into this big unknown, which is, you know, uncomfortable for me. I'd always mm. worked hard. A little scary. Very scary. And so my girlfriends knew that, and they had arranged a spa day the day after I left work. And we go to the spa, and we all turn our phones off. And we're in the spa for hours. We had a lovely morning. Um, we we're all, like, giggling and laughing to the point that we almost got kicked out because we were laughing so hard. Mm. Um, and we come out of the spa, and I'm, I'm at the desk to pay, and I pull out my phone, and I turn it back on, and I'm kind of idly scrolling through my phone. And I have an email from a colleague, and the, the subject line just says the Pope. And there's a link oh. to an article that shows that the Pope, and we're, I think, six weeks out from the wedding at this point, and because it was May, maybe eight weeks, but the article says that the Pope is going to be in um, South America on the date of our wedding and that this trip has been planned for a very long time. And the email just says, what's happening? And somehow in that moment, I just knew, you know, I literally felt sick. I felt uh, like somebody punched me in the gut and I almost actually fell over. You know, I think I had been starting to suspect, you know, I knew something wasn't right for a couple months, mm -hmm. but you know, the head and the heart kind of don't want to align. And I didn't know what at that point, but at that moment, I just knew. And I immediately text Paulo. And I'm like, what the hell is happening? And I forward him the article. And he he texts back. He's like, I don't know. I just found out this out myself. You know, let me, let me try to get to the bottom of this. I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll call you right away. I go home. Two of my friends came home with me. It was, it was still early in the morning. I think by then it was maybe noon. And I'm waiting for Paulo to call back and I'm just pacing, I'm pacing the apartment. Um, somebody cracks open a bottle of wine because I'm, I'm, they're like, you need to calm down. And I remember looking at my friends and I just had this look on my face and one of them looked at me and she said, what? And I said, what if this is all a lie? And there was silence. And I just kept saying it. I said, what if this is all a lie? And they didn't even know what to say. And one of them said, well, it can't be that bad. I'm sure there'll still be a wedding. Like there, there has to be an answer. So he, he calls back and he tells me that it's a big misunderstanding and that what has happened is that the Pope marrying us is going to be so controversial that the former living Pope, Pope Benedict, who's still alive, who's very, very conservative, to the point that Paolo told me we weren't inviting him to the wedding because he would never approve of Pope Francis marrying two divorcees. He's so upset that Pope Francis is going to do all of this that he's intervened. So it's internal Vatican politics that he's gone behind Pope Francis's back and made it so that he cannot marry us. And he arranged the trip to South America. And there's all this internal conflict going on at the Vatican, which, OK, also sounds believable, you know. And I said, well, what are we going to do? And he said, I don't know. I'm going to fly to Rome. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. And, we're, you know, we're going to figure it out. And no matter what, we're still getting married. Even if I marry you under a bridge, well, there's still going to be a wedding. That's his story. I just know from that point on, I stopped believing him. You know, mm -hmm. I just yeah. know that he's lying. And over the course of the next few weeks, I am trying to figure everything out. And I ask him to fly to New York. He claims he's gone to the Vatican and they're trying, they're, they're working it all out. They're going to bring the Pope back from right, South America right. and it's yeah. going to get fixed. I don't, I no longer believe him. But Why I ask, is he doing that at that point? I don't know. But like, I also, there's think? that tiny part of me that was like hoping still, I think that blind delusional part of me that was thinking maybe, maybe somehow yeah, there's, you know, and so I, I, I still said, do this. fly to New York. I need you to look me in the eye, fly to New York. I, you know, okay, okay, I will. So he arranges to come to New York. I send my daughter away for the weekend and I hadn't, you know, there were all these phone calls that I could have made any second. So many things I could have done, which I didn't do because I promised him I wouldn't ask any questions. Now that he's coming to New York, I start doing all these things. You know, I know somebody that knows, knows the Clintons very well. You know, he claims to be Bill Clinton's best friend and that Clinton right. is, is going to be, he was going to be in part of the wedding. He was going to read the speech before our, our elaborate wedding dance. He finds out for me, you know, and I, I get a text confirmation, you know, saying the Clintons have never heard of Paul McInerney. He's, you know, blah, 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 blah. I, and I got a friend to help me. I start calling places, you know, the castle that he claimed, you know, they never heard their, they never heard of the wedding. There is no wedding that day. You know, they never heard the name Paolo Meccarini. They never heard the name Benita Alexander, you know, one by one, you know, the caterer, the, you know, the, this, the, that 
I didn't have not enough that I know already. So now I'm fuming, fuming. And he's coming to my house. And I'm also in a panic. Uh, who is this man? Right. Things are starting to unravel. Yeah. yeah. I don't know him. You know, whoever this man I thought I was marrying is, I, I don't know him. I'm a little bit scared. You know, what is he capable of? What else is he lying about? Well, I'm sure you're like, if I'm finding this out now, what if he knows that this is all not real? Did you ever fear for your life? Like, no, but what I did do that that weekend, I, I was I was in a panic and I texted some of my friends and I said, listen, Paula's coming here. And I said, if I text you this word, it was one word, it means I need you to call the police now. And oh. so I kind of put everybody on alert. There's Smart. a police precinct right across the street from me. I had no idea what to expect. Yeah. You know? Like, um, is he coming back? Back, Matt, like, is he angry? Is he, what state of mind is he in? I didn't know. And this was probably the craziest conversation I've ever had in my life. He shows up at my apartment and, you know, I hope, op- and I, I'm, I'm like pacing. I'm crazy. I, I was so angry. We had a very expensive bottle of champagne that someone had given us as an engagement gift. And I opened it and I'm, you know, I'm swigging it and, you know, taking swigs of this thing. And when, when he rings the doorbell, I open the door and he's standing there in his, you know, beautiful suit and with his suitcase. Like he says, hi, my love. You know, you call me my love. And I'm like, hi, my love. You know, and I I mean, talk about a movie scene. I have the champagne bottle. I'm like waving it over my head. I'm like, hi, my love. I'm like, you want to tell me what the hell's going on and blah, blah, blah. And I'm screaming nonstop. You're lying this blah, 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 blah. Yeah. He's he's unflappable. He's just, he doesn't even, he's just steady, calm, quiet. Whoa. I probably went on for 15 minutes. No joke. He finally is like, are you finished? <sighs> I'm like, I guess so. You know, and because I'm, I'm pounding the counter. He had yeah. come in at that point of the kitchen counter. I'm pounding. You're lying about this. And I'm, I'm screaming at him. Why would you do this to me? Why would you do this to my friends? Why would you do this to my family? I even said to him, are you sick? Are you crazy? Yeah. Do we need to get you mental help? You know, I mean, I like, I don't understand. And why would you lie to your mother? And why would you, you know, blah, 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 blah. I finish. And he's just like, he gets very stoic. And he's like, I have to tell you something. Hmm. I have to tell you something I've never told anybody before. I'm thinking, oh God, no. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And he's, you know, the head drops and a very serious, a very melodramatic, right? Hmm. He's like, remember that secret network of doctors I told you I was part of? Yeah. What's more than that? I said, what do you mean it's more than that? It's connected to the CIA. I'm employed by the CIA. I'm thinking, ah, yeah, sure you are. (sighs) Um, (laughs) Convenient. Yeah. And then it gets worse. And then he's like, and you remember I told you that, um, you know, I sometimes have had to go into war zones as part of, he had told me that sometimes he had to go into war zones as part of the secret network of doctors. I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm not really a doctor when I go in there. I said, excuse me? He said, I'm actually a sniper. <laughs> oh <my God>. Wow. <laughs> okay. I can't even say it with a straight face. Yeah. It's just it's like so I'm insane. a sniper for the CIA. And in my head, I'm like, what the f? Yeah, you know. What was your oh reaction? When he I'm said like, that? I and you're texting that. Honestly, in my head, I'm like, word. okay, he's he's obviously he's lying. He's not well, and this is so demented. I'm just like, I got to change. So I can't. Please yeah. don't go. Like, stop, stop. Oh, and somehow, man. so I changed the subject. And then the other thing that happened in that conversation. So then I start kind of backing up, and I I I said, why do you lie to me? Why are you lying to me? And he kept trying to get closer to me, and I kept saying, stay the away from me mm-hmm. and my love my love calm down i'm like i'm not gonna calm down and i'm literally have my back against the fridge and so he's standing about two feet in front of me and i said why why would you do this to me and i said at some some point i said i'm a journalist at some point yeah. i was going to wake up yeah. and start asking questions it, it was inevitable and he cocked his head and he got this little smile on his face and really creepy actually he's like i know that's why i love you so much Ugh. Ew, I just got exactly. the chills. Literally, a so chill. So he's literally getting off. A, little, I mean, a yeah. chill rent from the top of my head to my Weird. feet. Oh, man. <sighs> do, you so, bl- do you believe that? Yeah. Because I mean, well, it explains a lot. I do believe that. So that was like maybe the first truthful thing he, maybe. he told you. Is yeah. That <sighs> I knew this was going to, basically, yeah. the, I knew this was all going to happen. And no, I think it was finally the thrill. Happening. I think yeah. it was a yeah. sick yeah. thrill. Just so like then this, after that, I couldn't wait for him to leave. And his last parting words to me were, um, I'll see you in Barcelona. Because now, of course, he's, you know, reinstated this trip to Barcelona. And I had made a very calculated decision 
um, that weekend that I am now, I don't want to call it a game, but that, okay, mm-hmm. you want to do this to me? Okay. You know, Jake's game up. on, game yeah, on. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because now I want the truth. Yeah. And now I want to get all the way to the bottom of it. What else is he lying about? What else is going on? He's not going to tell me the truth. And the only way I'm going to get the truth is to kind of convince him, like he's telling me that the wedding is going to be reconvened and everything is going to be okay. So I kind of play along with it. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah sure, I'm a little let's sure, see. you know. Let, let's eh. see how this unravels. And I realized I'm going to have to keep doing this for a little while. The second he walked out the door, I hire, I make calls, I hire a private investigator and I go into full on investigative mode. Yeah. You know, I mean, I woke up out of my blind love haze, you know, mm-hmm. and went back into journalism mode and full on, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. my house looked like something out of a law and order episode. There were, <laughs> I had binders, tons wow. of them organized by, and I start pulling all this stuff together. And, you know, I very quickly find out that he's not really divorced, you know, so he never could have legally married me in the first place. Nothing. And I mean, nothing about the wedding was real. None, none of it. It was all this sick, twisted fantasy in his head. None of the places were booked. None of the things were ever going to happen. The invitations, I, some of them were still sitting there, the ones for the dignitaries and celebrities. He left to the airport one day with a bag full of these invitations. I'd love to know what dumpster those ended up in because they sure as hell didn't go to those people. And then I end up hiring another private investigator in Italy to try and get more information in Italy. You know, someone at the Secret Service in, in Italy started helping me, you know, helping me out. I, you know, of course, he doesn't know the Pope. He's not the Pope's personal yeah. doctor. The Vatican He's is never like, been to the Vatican. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. That's like one of the most locked down places please, in the world. Yeah, like you please. can't just waltz please. into the Vatican. Like, yeah. To and then quick favor. I decide that I really want to get to the bottom of it. And I'm going to go to Europe and, you know, get some of my own answers. And I wanted to go to the house in Barcelona. You know, I mean, yeah. clearly there's a reason he hasn't let me go to that house in Barcelona. At this point, I have enough information already, but I wanted to see things myself and yeah. I wanted to know. And so I actually flew to, to Rome on what was supposed to be my wedding day. Mm. Um, and so many people that the wedding got canceled so late that a lot of people still went to Italy, you know, yeah. and I mean, at least it was Italy and not like, I don't right. know, Iowa or something, yeah. <laughs> you know? And how did you cancel it? Just so people understand how that so worked. So right after um, that weekend, um, when he had, he had come, mm-hmm. um, I told him, and, and thank, thank goodness, it was, it was yeah. very convenient timing. The allegations in Sweden were really heating up again at the time, and he was so stressed. Right. And I just said, you know, my love, I think we should just postpone the wedding. You know, like, I don't, mm-hmm. I don't think it's a good time for us to have the wedding. And I think I'm just going to send an email to everyone apologizing, but, you know, and he must have breathed the biggest sigh of relief yeah, like, oh, ever, you. you know? Yeah. yeah. You but know? he acted like he didn't want Yeah, the and he's like, oh, this is on. devastating, but I guess it's the right decision. Oh, and okay. So I sent an email, you know, I was very vague intentionally because I didn't mm-hmm. want anyone to know that I was investigating him. And I basically just said, due to unfortunate personal circumstances, you know, we have to cancel the wedding. We're very sorry, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we'll let you know when it's reconvened in the future because I wanted him to think that I still thought that it was going to happen smart, in the future. Yeah. Oh, so smart. Did you did you have a lot of people reaching back out to you? Like, oh, yeah. what the hell? People were really worried, you know? And yeah. I only people really closest to me knew what was happening. So some some people did. Yeah. I mean, I was so worried about, I was so worried about retaining, you know, the secrecy of what I was doing. I had, I set up this whole secret email account and pass, you know, secret words and everything for the trip. Uh, I had Good three, you. three girlfriends that arranged to meet me in Rome. And it was kind of, it was partly an investigative trip. It was kind of like the ultimate girls trip mm-hmm. and kind of like a big F you trip. And I wanted to go to some of the places that I thought I was going to go to. Mm-hmm. One of my friends convinced me to bring one of my dresses with me. I had a red dress yeah. that I was supposed to wear. I think the Thursday night before Beautiful the wedding. Dress. And she's like, you know, these dresses were made just for you. Why don't you just bring it? And maybe we'll yeah. take some photos. And at first I was like, eh, I don't know if I want to do that. And then I thought, you know what? He's never seen these dresses and they were for me. Why not? And yeah. so that's what that trip was. It was partly investigative. And every single place I went, I started videotaping. I didn't know what I was going to do with it at the time, but I just felt like I should keep a record of it. And every place we went, no, never heard of the wedding. Never, you know, it was just, you know, one thing after another. I went to the place where Elton John was supposed to play, um, just because I wanted to see it and kind yeah. of imagine what it would have been like. We took photos in the red dress. Yeah. Um, 
That's cool. You still have those pictures. Yeah. So it was a lot. It was a lot of laughter and a lot of tears. It was a yeah. lot of both. Mm-hmm. And then I went to Barcelona and it was me, my friend Lee from Australia and my best friend, Nancy. And our only plan in Barcelona was to go to the house and just, you know, and I fully expected to find another woman there. You know, at that point, I didn't know who it was going to be. Um, and my friends had on their phones, they had a photo of his wife in Italy and, you know, I had pictures of her. I know what she looked like. There were a couple of other women I had pieced together that I suspected he might have things going on with. So they had photos of all these women on their phones in case they answered the door. And we kind of went through what are the scenarios because I'm still communicating with him right up until that morning. And he's telling me that he's in Russia and he's been there for about a month. And I told him that I'm so upset about the wedding that I've gone on a trip to upstate New York with my girlfriends and I don't want to talk to him. So I'm not, I'm Good not, cover. you know, I'm yeah. li- lying to him. So he has no idea I'm in Europe. He's telling me he's in Russia and we go through the scenarios. Okay. We go to the house. Nobody's there. He answers the door. Another woman answers the door. Those were sort of our three scenarios. And we didn't really have a plan other than to ask questions. And this is less than a week after the wedding. And I'm a nervous wreck. You know, I'm just, and the, the other thing was I had asked him for the address so people could send wedding gifts. During my investigation, I find out that this is a bogus address. So I now have the right address. He doesn't even know I have the address for the house. So this is about 20, maybe 45 minutes outside of Barcelona. This beautiful little seaside town. And we're driving. And I had also, partly as a lark, but also because I didn't know what I was getting into, I had a blonde wig with me um, just because I didn't know if I was going to need to disguise myself. So I'm Mm. in the backseat of this car with this hideous blonde wig. And my friends are driving. We're all nervous because we don't know what, we're going to find. And we go up this winding road to this house and I decide to stay in the car initially and videotape because I wanted them to kind of figure out what was going on first. Mm -hmm. So they walk up to the hill um, to the house and ring the doorbell and I'm videotaping on my cell phone in the car. And there comes Paolo down the steps. And that's when I first lose it. You know, I'm screaming and swearing in the car. I'm like, you blah, blah, blah. You told me you're in Russia, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I can see them talking to him, but I can't, I don't know what they're saying. Yeah. I can't hear, mm-hmm. Ugh, that but I'm like torture. I'm shaking literally. And I'm swearing and I'm so much emotions coming out. And in the middle of this, I'm close. He can't see me because I'm sort of behind some trees at the top of the hill, mm-hmm. but I'm close enough that all of a sudden I see a woman, a blonde woman and two little children. And even from where I am, I can hear these little kids calling him dad. Oh, really? And that woman is not his Italian wife. So I like, lose it. Oh, there's so in, that's why I haven't been to the house in Barcelona because he has a whole other family there. Ah, a third family. What did that scenario cross your mind before that that could no. happen? Really, little kids? I never. I was so shocked. It just another woman, yes, but a whole other family. I, I had no indication whatsoever that he had a whole other family. I was oh my in utter shock, utter shock, and I was livid. That's when mm-hmm. I just lost it. You know. Yeah. Um, and by the time my friends came back to the car, I just, Nancy was recording on her cell phone and she forgot to turn it off. And you just hear me. Yeah. I'm wailing. I'm just wailing. So, I, I'm just all just the emotion. The pain. Just, yeah. I was in so much pain. It was horrible. It yeah. was horrible. Um, and then I decided to confront him finally. The holidays are just around the corner and HelloFresh makes this busy time of year easier than ever with chef-crafted recipes and pre-portioned ingredients delivered right to your door so you can spend less time meal planning and prepping. Plus, save money on dinner with HelloFresh and put it toward your holiday shopping. HelloFresh is cheaper than grocery shopping and 25% less expensive than takeout. I love HelloFresh's variety of recipes. In fact, they have over 35 weekly recipes, so there's something that will please everyone. You can also easily customize your recipes by swapping proteins or sides upgrading to choice proteins, or even adding protein to a veggie meal, which is what I do pretty much every week. Quality is HelloFresh's priority. Ingredients travel from the farm to your home in less than seven days, so you know they are fresh. I've been using HelloFresh for several years now, and I will vouch for them that all the produce I've ever gotten has been fresh. I don't think I've ever had a piece of rotten produce show up in one of my boxes. I just absolutely love the simplicity of HelloFresh. The recipe cards break down the meal prep super, super easy. All the ingredients are pre-portioned, the cleanup is a breeze, and you can have a delicious, nutritious, home-cooked meal on the table in 30 minutes or less. It's absolutely amazing. 
So what are you doing? Go to hellofresh.com slash milehire65 and use code milehire65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Go to hellofresh.com slash milehire65 and use code milehire65 for 65% off plus free shipping. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. Well, I'm so glad you had your friends with you yeah. in that moment who are very they were true incredible. friends. Yeah. yeah, they're incredible. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad you didn't friends. go there by yourself. And, yeah, like, I know. Me too. Yeah, that and it seems been... like you do have some like good times that the three of you had oh, along yeah. the way. Oh yeah, no, and... we had a lot of laughs too. Yeah, and then we, you know, we were making pit stops and taking pictures and just like flipping him yeah. a finger everywhere. Yeah, and... I saw it. that's yeah. great. I love that. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people have asked me why I didn't go to the door. Um, and until I saw the kids, I had planned to if he was there. But once, and they were little, they were like four and six. So this and, was like a very new family of his. Yeah. Wow. wow. Once I saw those kids, I just couldn't, I just froze. I mean, we're all moms. And I just thought, I'm not causing a scene in front of these innocent little kids. Good you know? for you. Whatever's going on, my beef's with him. Not even with that one poor woman. You know, I just, I just didn't want to do it. You know, I mean, mm. I could have gone and had. Some crazy yeah, housewives of Barcelona yeah, moment, you know? Right, yeah, big <laughs> yeah. scene and but stuff. But we all, yeah. and Nancy and Lee felt the same way. They backed off very quickly after that because they, they, they didn't, didn't let things get hostile and start yelling. At what's them. the point? Yeah. You know? Right, right. Yeah, and so what their interaction with him is very strange too. Very strange because, and Nancy speaks Spanish, and they acted like they they said, you know, look, we just came because we, you know, the wedding got canceled so late. So, you know, Lee still came all the way from Australia. So we just thought we'd come and say hi. And Nancy says his his eyes were just like darting left and right, like yeah, he makes like, a sound with her. Like she, she said, you could see him. He was so shocked, so shocked to see them. And, and yeah. he was kind of trying to calculate the next line. So the first thing he says is, oh, yeah, yeah. I just flew in from Russia this morning. How? On yeah. what? What yeah. flight gets you from Russia to <laughs> just, just yeah. Barcelona in an hour, what? by the way? Um, <laughs> but clearly he's thinking, what I, you know, the, but the other thing that's really interesting is he never asks about me. You know, your yeah. your best friends show up at your door. Like, you don't ask, like, you know, where's like, where's Benita? You don't invite them in, not even for, he just wanted to get rid of, he kept saying to them, where's your car? How'd you get here? You know, and, you know, oh. he just wanted them gone. Yeah. And once they saw the kids, they were very uncomfortable too. And so they just yeah, kind of. Yeah, you don't want to link, you like linger. Yeah. Was, yeah. They just kind of said goodbye. Yeah, a couple Super minutes. Quick. Yeah. I'm sure they would love to have gone inside and let's nancy kicked herself <laughs> afterwards nancy's like i should have this i should have that i'm like no I I it's better did. this way yeah. yeah they did what's right mm -hmm. and it's like what's the point too it's like, yeah exactly where, where is it gonna go he's just gonna tell you a bunch more lies and right it's you know the jig is up already so well uh, and then the best part was we we drove to a restaurant um because i needed wi-fi and i composed this text to him that's literally about this long laying out all all the lies and all the everything and calling him this and that and yeah. blah 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 and everyone talk to you again never want to see you again i hit send and we're all kind of on pins and needles waiting to see what comes back it took a few minutes but he wrote back one word wow i know that message is so Just, infuriating especially wow. and with an exclamation mark yeah. too like, wow that's all you could say wow the man who always has something to say has caught. nothing what else is he going to say? He was there's not. He knows. He's like, there's nothing He's I can game say over. to this. Yeah. Game over. He's like, I just have to end it right here. Yep. Cause... There's nothing to say. Oh, my God. That's so infuriating. You must have just wanted to, like, punch a wall. I can't even be so angry. But for him, he's he's like, wow, all right, it's over. Yep. Moving on. Yep. But you're like, you've just completely uprooted my entire life. And Yeah, yeah. well, he vastly underestimated me. but <laughs> Yeah. But at that point, you've, I mean... I changed your life. I was devastated. I was yeah. devastated. I mean, yeah. heartbroken doesn't even begin to describe it. I mean, I just. Yeah. And I had been so amped up, I think, and in such adrenaline mode because I was investigating and I was, you know, sort of in truth seeking mode and I just wanted answers. And now I was crushed. Yeah. I mean, you have just to really crushed. let go of the idea of the life that you thought you were going to have well, and I had this given new it, so adventure. So much was at stake. I had given up everything. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Yep, and your you know? daughter. And I'm a single mom a now, and I just gave up everything. Mm -hmm. I got nothing, you know. Yeah, and invested like what fifty thousand yeah, dollars in my own this money. Wedding. I mean, because yeah. money was never his thing, but there, I did pay for the invitations. I paid for my dresses, and these mm -hmm. were all things he was supposed to pay me back for. I had no reason to believe he wouldn't pay me back. He was always yeah. very generous, but now I'm also out this money. Mm -hmm. Ugh, it was so messed up. I'm surprised he didn't try to take from you more financially throughout this and i guess maybe just he just didn't that need was to his yeah. yeah yeah it's just normally in these con stories that's i know that's what you always hear it is wow. so that's the other question the two questions are 
what was his end game mm-hmm. and why? Why? Yeah, what, why? What was your motive? Why were you doing this? And Ugh, why would you take, pure take delusion. it so far? Yeah. But then, you know, I come home and I'm absolutely devastated, you mm-hmm. know? But my immediately, I it was like lightning bolts were, you know, I, I was like, oh my God, you know, if he's lying to me like this, there's yeah. no way. There's just no way he's not lying in his medical and professional life. There's mm-hmm. no way. And that was terrifying mm-hmm. because look at what he's doing. And he's operating on people who are dying and who have no other hope. And I just thought, oh my God, people are in danger. Like people could die because of this man. And that's, I decided very quickly that I need, I need to expose him. I need to go public. You know, I didn't want to. Good for you. I did not want to. I did not want to go. I've always been a very private person. I knew what this meant. Mm-hmm. I knew this. I knew this meant telling the whole story, including the fact that I hadn't gotten involved with him. Mm-hmm. You know, while I was still doing a story on him and being very honest, I, I couldn't expose him without being completely honest myself. Yeah. yeah. Um. And I knew, and a lot of my friends didn't want me to do it. They, they're, you know, they warned me. They said, Don't put People are going to come after you. You know, they're going to call you stupid. They're going to question you. It doesn't even matter if you're right. They're going to question your integrity. I said, I can't not do this. I couldn't live with myself if I don't do this. And I, at the time, I thought I might be the only person that had that information, you know, and could expose him. And so I was in a rush. I was just like, let me find the fastest way to go public. Thinking about this guy's a surgeon. He's mm-hmm. operating on, yep. you know, you got to know Hannah, her parents. And and so I'm sure that in the back of your mind, you're like, I got to make sure that. I got to make this says, right. Yeah, you know? yeah. I also felt, I felt, res- I felt guilty. You know, I felt stupid. I thought, how did this happen to me? You know, how did this happen to me? And like, I'm smart, you know, um, mm-hmm. and I know I'm smart, you know, and I know, and I'm a journalist. I'm not supposed to get duped. I just got duped. And not only that, but I convinced all these other people, my friends, my family, mm-hmm. they're all along for the ride with me because I believed that they believed it, you know, and how do I explain this to all of them, you know, and, you know, I felt terrible. And there's, how do you, you know, people, uh, people other people lost money. A lot of money. Mm-hmm. So, it, yeah, it's just hard to let somebody get away with that, too. Like, how do you just move on and just mm-mm. let somebody... Because, I mean, in a way, it's like he wins because he gets to just go on as with no consequences virtually. That's what he until, was hoping for. Yeah, I mean, for that's what he was hoping for until, you know, Adam and NBC comes along and everybody starts digging into his his professional resume and starting to uncover that there's a lot of... Uh, fallacies there as well so i decided to go public and um with an article in vanity fair i was and they because they said they could do it very quickly i mean this is we're talking july of 2015 when i find everything out the article came out in january of 2016 and you know they did more investigating and they found it out even more than i had find out found out you know they found out that there were lies on his you know cv he had lied about different things in his career um and so it was a very damning article, you know, that, you know, here's this world famous surgeon who's telling these absurd lies. And what was interesting about it, I didn't know that at the time, but the article came out and then a week later in Sweden, this scathing documentary comes out, um, which exposes all his medical lies. Did you know about that no. prior? Oh, wow. So this producer had in Sweden had been following Paulo for a year, unbeknownst to me, ostensibly to talk about the allegations and the scientific misconduct. So Paolo had let him follow him because Paolo thought he was going to do a positive story. In the course of doing the story, his name is, is Busse. He finds out that, okay, wait a minute. There's some really screwed up things going on here. So the documentary was shocking to watch. It's a three-part documentary. It's horrifying. I mean, and it basically talked about the fact that he had not gotten any of the approvals he was supposed to get before doing this experimental procedure on people, he hadn't done animal experiments. When you do something like this, you do a radical, even if it's pioneering and groundbreaking and risky, which he never said it wasn't risky, but you still do experiments on animals beforehand. Mm -hmm. He blatantly lied. He told people he had done this thing with this plastic trachea in pigs. No one pig anywhere ever got a plastic trachea. There were no pigs. He didn't do the animal Just experiments. completely skipped over that. There were some experiments on rats, but they didn't start until after he had already put one of them in, some of them in humans. And guess what? All the rats died. Oh my God. So he's literally used people as human guinea pigs. 
Yeah. Okay. So n- n- Completely that, that in itself is so appalling and egregious that there are no words for it. But not only that, he's he's blatantly lied to the world because he's been standing there at press conferences and in interviews, including mm-hmm. interviews he did mm-hmm. with, you know, me and many other people yeah. talking glowing terms about how this is working beautifully and the stem yeah. cells are yeah. integrating into the plastic trachea and this is a miracle. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, what's actually it's happening absolute horror. is yeah. horror. These patients suffocated to death. This thing never could have worked, had mm-hmm. no hope of ever working. Mm-hmm. There's no evidence whatsoever that the stem cells ever did what he claimed they would do. So this thing rotted inside their throats. Oh, my God. The families talk about so the patients sad. smelling <sighs> because it was rotting inside their throats. And their body's like trying to eject it, right? They Some of them suffocated to death on their own blood because this thing <sighs> didn't work. I mean, it's it's oh, like nightmarish, people. ghoulish, awful. It's It's awful. The reality of what happened versus what he was claiming to the world are so starkly different. I, it's disgusting. I can't. It makes me so angry. I can't. I can't even. It, did he talk about anything going bad ever with no. any of us? Or never, never once was he like, "I'm worried about this patient because." No, he was always issues. careful to say that this was risky, mm-hmm. and that he couldn't couldn't guarantee that people were going to live. Of course, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But he hid behind and still continues to hide about behind this argument that anytime you do something groundbreaking, yeah. people always die, which is true. It is so true. So he'll point to lung transplants, heart transplants, whatever transplant. Mm-hmm. Always, when you're doing something new, some of the first patients die. And, and, and he, he uses that. That's what always happens. Pioneer. Well, that's true, except for two things. Number one, they got the approvals they were supposed to get. Mm-hmm. They did the experiments they were supposed to get. And number two, when it stopped working, when people started dying, they stopped. You don't yeah. keep going. Yeah. He's <sighs> reckless. Did He's he just reckless. Did he ever have nights, you know, sleepless nights where he was worried about a patient, where he seemed He was worried about his concern, career and reputation. But never the people. He never said like, oh, I'm this, you know, I'm worried about Hannah. Nothing. He seemed, when Hannah died, he seemed absolutely devastated. Really? Yeah. And cried on the phone. Do you think he, did he seem devastated about her? I thought or, so. Okay. I thought so. In hindsight, maybe he was devastated because he realized this was bad. You know, this was the first toddler and the, to- the first toddler just died. And maybe he realized it was all going to come tumbling down. I mean, mm-hmm. this investigation that was going on at Karolinska had been going on for some time. And maybe six months into our relationship, you know, things were yeah. happening. So... He must have known. He must have known that things were going to implode or that there was a good chance that they were, you know? And Mm -hmm. so I don't know. Maybe this was some sort of desperate, fanciful attempt, sick attempt to hold on to maybe somehow. And I think about all the surprises, right? You know, I don't even think those surprises were for me. I think, you know, and there are videos where I'm just like, oh my God, and I'm absolutely adoring. And I think my adulation of him you know, it was all about feeding his ego, you know? Yeah. He loved the way my re- I reacted to the surprises. So it was all about, I think, you know, all about him. He's just like a puppet master. He, like, figures out a way to, like, manipulate everybody around him to yeah. serve that purpose to, for mm-hmm. him. And, and the, thing that, the thing that, to this day, I can almost not talk about without getting emotional, though, is my daughter, you know? Yeah. Think so. back. He, he saunters into our lives on his fake white horse right as her dad is dying from brain cancer. <sighs> How do you do that to a child? You know? And you Evil. know the whole time, the whole time, you're talking about the school in Barcelona, the this, the that. You're sitting in front of a child and you know the whole thing is lies. And one you day, know, you make this little girl start to fall in love with you and think that we're going to have this life and you know the whole time it can never happen. You know, it's one thing to do it to me, but a child? Oh, you must have just felt so angry. Like it just, burns me uh, up in a way I can't describe it. It makes I'm me sure. so angry. You know, I mean, it hasn't been easy for me, but look, come on, one way or another, I'm going to be okay. You know? Yeah. You're a father. How the mm-hmm. hell do you do that to a child? It's unfor- it's unforgivable. It's absolutely unforgivable. Uh, I mean, I've only been a mother for now three months, and I just cannot imagine how angry and disgusted you would feel thoroughly i mean how is she 
how I'm did guilty. she? I also feel guilty mm. because I brought him into her life. I can life, see how you would you feel know? like that. You shouldn't, but yeah. I almost just... sometimes feel like I brought a monster into our house, you know? So how did you tell her? How did you kind of break the news to her? Um, Right around the same time that I hired the investigator, I sat her down and I said, I have to tell you something. She didn't, she didn't believe me at first. Oh, no, really? that can't be true. That can't be true. You know, <sighs> um, because they had started clashing a little bit mm-hmm. towards the end of our relationship. Um, I think she was, she was very young at the beginning and very vulnerable also. And I think he felt that he could easily manipulate her, but towards the end of our relationship, she was sort of starting to stand her ground against right. him. And so they had started, um, sort of veering apart a little bit. And I think that helped actually, you know? Yeah. Um, and now she's just, um, she's funny. Um, she's very, very angry at him. And she always says that, you know, she's like, mom, if I ever run into him, you know, I'm punching him, you know? <laughs> like <laughs> She should. And I'll laugh. And she's like, yeah, but I'm not kidding, you know? Yeah. Um, and then her other, other favorite joke, which is her dark, twisted humor. Um, she's like, yeah, I tell, I tell people my mom dated a serial killer. I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, <laughs> you know? But she's like, mom, technically, like, yeah. you, you know, kind of three people behavior. makes you a serial killer. And she's like, I'm yeah. sorry. Kind of true. You know, yeah. he, he put this artificial trachea into eight patients. Mm-hmm. Seven of them are dead. The only one that's still alive had the thing taken out. Yeah. So did they have that taken out after seeing all no, of this come out? He had, or? He, the one that's still alive had it taken out before because he was having problems with it. Oh, <sighs> But all the others are dead. Do you know how he's doing now? I don't. He was in um, the Ukraine. We lost track of him. You know, I think mm-hmm. he's still alive, though. Well, hopefully he was able to. I don't know. I mean, how do you even yeah. feel that? If you look at this, there does he have have some liability in this, right? Like, is there? Well, so they they this is a very complicated case because how do you prove? Mm-hmm. A, it's an experimental surgery. And there was never any question that it was a risky surgery. And he never promised, right, to yeah. save anyone's life. He he would tell people, I'm your only hope. You know, I'm I'm it. I'm the last door. But he never outright said, I'm, you know, I I'm promise you, you. Yeah. that you're going to live. Yeah. Um, and so there's it's very complicated legally because it's a gray area. How do you prove that he knew this thing wasn't going to work? And how do you prove that that's the thing that killed them, especially when patients are already sick so like he says un- they have underlying health conditions and you know that's although not all of them did right but, right um so they've tried they tried in sweden one time to bring criminal charges against him for manslaughter and then it kind of fell apart because of that because it was just they can't too, there's too no difficult. evidence to prove that correct but in sweden i mean after all this became public talk about a scandal you know i mean people obviously he was fired but People were pir- fired. People on the Nobel Prize Committee were fired, stepped down in shame. It's a huge scandal in Sweden. They're a very proud country, you know, yeah. and this is this is very embarrassing for them because they all, you know, again, it's not just me who believed him, you know. It's famous doctors, institutions, scientists, you know, people who inv- gave him research grants, people who invested money in him, so many people. He fooled so many people. And it's embarrassing, you know, and... It's such a big scandal in Sweden that um, they went back and revisited the case. And he finally was put on trial this year in April. They could only charge him in the connection with the deaths of the three patients that actually got the transplant done in Stockholm in Sweden. And so that's what the trial was for. Um, And I went. I went to the trial. It lasted for about a month. Um, It was on charges of aggravated assault. And you were there the entire time? Yeah. Wow. Good for you. Yeah. And he... But they... He kind of got off with a slap on the hand. They found him guilty um, in connection with the death of one patient, this Turkish girl, who, and her case is just... It's, yeah. It's horrible. It's so it's horrible. He, he she butchered had a that girl. 190 surgeries or something. Like 191 yeah. surgeries. He, he, she went through so much she before went through she hell. died. Her life was a living hell. <sighs> and she didn't need this damn thing, you know? Um, and they found him guilty in connection with her death, but because it's been so long... Um, and because the law in Sweden is, quite frankly, a little bit weak, he basically got nothing. He didn't get any jail time. You know, he doesn't even have to pay a fine. So they, the prosecution has appealed, which is good. Um, so this isn't over yet. They've appealed, and there will be another trial. Um, so we'll see. You know, yeah. But he hasn't lost his medical license, right? He has not spent a single day behind bars. Yeah. And mm. as 
far as we know, he still has a medical license. It's a little different in Europe. The way I it's been explained to me is once you have a medical license, it's kind of up to each individual country. Whether they honor it allow, or not. Yeah. yeah like, sure. for instance, he's never operating in Sweden again. I don't know what other countries, but if a country allows him to operate, yeah, he can operate. There's nothing stopping him. I mean, for his patient's sake, I hope they do a Google search yeah, um, yeah. before they let him operate on him. But yeah, he can still operate. That's what makes this so upsetting. So upsetting and so egregious. And that's, you know, one of the reasons I went to the trial in, in May is because he needs to be held accountable. You know, he's been walking around all yeah. this time, getting away with this, claiming he just wants to help people. And he was just doing this to help people. And he hasn't been held accountable. There have been no consequences. And it's wrong. There need to be consequences. And this isn't even about me anymore. This mm -mm. is about his patients. Yeah, you, you have know? a bigger mission now. Yeah, much bigger. You know, I want justice for his patients. Yeah. And for the families of those patients. Mm -hmm. I mean, I sat in court in Sweden in April and the very first person to get the artificial trachea, this Eritrean man um, who was living in Iceland, Andamarium Bayen, his wife came to court. And it was very difficult for her to come. She had panic attacks before coming to court. Mm -hmm. And she sat in that court crying. I mean, I was crying. I saw people on the jury crying. And she talked about how he suffered at the end and how he suffocated. And it was awful, you know. And he had little kids, you know. And he claims that all these patients were at death's door. And she sat in that courtroom and talked about how he was running to the bus, you know, days before the surgery. He did have cancer, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, and he was sick, but... He was His not quality of life door. wasn't, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he told him, he's a patient that he told, oh, I've done this. You're the first person, but I've done this on pigs before. Seriously? Oh, my God. He's evil. He is evil. I think he's evil. Yeah. I, I mean, you really evil. have to be to look at people who are in that type of situation and to lie to their face and tell them to trust you. That's evil. It is evil. I think, I mean, I, I'm not a professional. I can't diagnose him, but... I think he's a sociopath, you know? Yeah. I mean, there's no remorse. Mm -hmm. There's no guilt. There's no, re totally no regret. There's no nothing. He just, he doesn't care who he hurts. And he sees himself as the victim. Always. <laughs> uh -huh. In the in the few interviews that are, you know, that are out there of him, he's like, yeah. you think I'm some kind of beast? I'm, yeah, he's well, like, beast. Yeah, he calls He it, did it in court too. Yeah, you know? I'm he sure. He had like the yeah. fake tears and the, yeah, you were just saying poor, poor me. I'm like, poor he's you. He's really crying. What about right your there? patients, you know? Yeah. Did like he, he in court with the fake crying? Mm -hmm. Was he crying about the patients, or was all it I've more about done, all I've ever done was want to save people, and I've been silenced for ten years? And uh, he tells these very dramatic stories about how, with a Turkish girl, you know, in the surgery, he went in and he pumped her heart with his hands, and he did what he's the hero, you know, he's just he in his mind tried he's to do the everything hero. he could yep. to to save her, and and that why is he being so crucified hard. for this? Yeah, yeah and you're sitting right there in front of him. Ah, oh, he must have just been like oh, wanting there to was, scream there were out. Day, the days when he was just blatantly lying, it took everything in me to, to hold like, it together and keep composed. Mm -hmm. I wanted to jump over there and be like, hey, can I please <laughs> testify? You know, yeah. And not only me, there are four doctors in Sweden who are the ones that are responsible for you know bringing the allegations of scientific misconduct against him. Four whistleblower doctors who put their own careers on the line and spent thousands of hours digging through all his papers and everything and literally, you know, making note of all the lies and all the discrepancies. And they're the ones that blew this whole thing open medically. And they went through hell too because Karolinska didn't believe them at first and they were ostracized and threatened with losing their jobs. And three of them testified and their testimony was damning. Um, oh, I'm sure. And then there was one day that we were sitting in court and Busse, the who did the documentary against about him, you know, me, who's obviously been very public and talking about this for seven years and did my own documentary about him. And then one of the whistleblowers and we're th three sitting there right in front of him. And I thought this must be his worst nightmare, you know? Um, yeah. A lot of people have, have put a lot on the line and worked very hard to try and bring him down. And it's not even really about bringing him down. It's about exposing him. You mm -hmm. know, I mm -hmm. mean, he's dangerous. Yeah. He's dangerous. He needs to be stopped. Future. You were telling me earlier he avoided eye contact with you during the entire thing. Yeah. I was very unsure how I would feel when I saw him in court. I haven't seen him in seven years since I saw him from, you know, while I was screaming in the car in Barcelona. And 
he was very close to me, probably where you are, Josh. And wow. It took a lot of internal gymnastics, you know, um, mm-hmm. because I was I was also there working. I was covering the trial for the Doctor Death podcast, and so I was in very much in professional mode, which helped. But and I was being filmed for there's a a docu series coming out next year on a major streaming platform about all of this. So I'm being filmed. I'm working, and then I'm feeling all these explosive emotions. <laughs> I was very angry, and that was my first reaction when I saw him. Um, hmm. And he wouldn't make eye contact with me, which infuriated me. But then after a few days, I just thought, I don't even care. I have nothing to say to him, you know? And there's nothing that he could say to me that would change anything. There's nothing that he could say that I would believe. Hmm. There's nothing he could say that would make me feel any better or, you know. And after a while, I was just sort of indifferent. I just I just don't, you make me sick. He just kind of makes me sick. He's a sick man. I mean, he's clearly mm-hmm. got major things going on because who does this? And and I don't think he could give you an explanation. I don't, I don't think, think there would be either. any way to explain away his actions and and just knowing him. None of it would make sense and it would just be, you know, it'd be always trying to paint himself in a positive light of like, oh, I did this because of, you know, this reason, because yeah. I did love you, well, and because to... I did, you know, I tried to do everything I possibly oh, could. I mean, he'll twist it around yeah. always. Yeah. He didn't look good, but I I can't. And there was a lot of debate about that among the amongst the journalists. And I don't know if that was all part of the act. Like he's he looked very disheveled. He's aged considerably. He had his hair pulled back in this crazy like Antonio Bandera style ponytail, which was not working on him. Uh, wow. yeah. <laughs> and you know this, he looked kind of like the crazy professor. You know. Yeah. Um, but I don't know if that was all part of the act. I you know. Yeah, could, right. Definitely yeah. could be part of his strategy. He's constantly strategizing. Of- mm-hmm. So one thing I don't think we went over unless I'm missing it. We talked about it earlier before we started recording, but your last conversation with him, you had a phone call with him. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I I first went public in 2016 in Vanity Fair and then, you know, all this stuff came out and it was kind of like the house of cards, you know, everything just fell apart. And then I wanted to tell the story my own way. You know, the Vanity Fair article only told part of the story and obviously I'm not telling it myself. And I realized I have so much material because he was always videotaping me, remember? And I have everything. I saved everything and all the texts and the video messages and then this and the that. So I decided to make my own documentary about it. And it's called He Lied About Everything. Mm-hmm. And it came out on Discovery on, on Valentine's Day. It's <laughs> really good. You guys have got to watch it. Thank you. It came out in 2018. And during the course of making that, um, a, I was telling the story, but I was, I was also trying to find him so I could confront mm-hmm. him. And I went several places around the world trying to find him, didn't find him. Met with the families of some of his patients, which was devastating. And then finally, after not being able to find him, I tried to get him on the phone. And we did it by calling from another phone and he picked up, you know, and for legal reasons, we weren't allowed to show his side of the conversation, only mine. But so he answers the phone. And they're videotaping me. And he's, I said, I said, Paolo, it's Benita. Oh. And immediately he went into this like soft voice. Mm-hmm. How are you? <laughs> and I thought this asshole. That's crazy. He thinks I'm calling to reconcile. That's, uh, he, yeah. he yeah. how are you? How are you doing? How have you been? And I'm like, oh. And I oh. just, I said, why did you lie to me? You know, why'd you lie about the wedding? Why'd you lie about this? Blah, 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 blah. A, you know, a sort of mm-hmm. truncated version of the way I was screaming at him in the apartment. And he just got quiet and he's like, I'm sorry. But it was the most flat, insincere po- apology I've ever heard in my life. He didn't mean it. Hmm, it was almost like not. in his head, he was like, okay, wait, I'm supposed to say I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And then the conversation didn't last long because I had to tell him I was recording him and then he hung up. But that was the last time I ever spoke to him. So was I'm sorry the last words he said to you? He said something else like, you've been through a lot or something like that. Hmm. And that was it. Yeah. Hang up, done. No fault of, of myself, but no. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't have anything to do with no. all of this you've been through, but that's just why. I know. I was just like, I wish we could like get into his head he and like care. figure out like, uh He cares about himself. You know, I wonder yeah. if he's watched anything that you've, you know, the I've documentary always or... wondered that too. Um, sometimes I get these weird comments, you know, like on TikTok and stuff oh, and I'm like, interesting. And, or the, on these, you know, those accounts that yeah. have no picture and like one f- friend or whatever they call, you know, yeah. Sometimes, and sometimes the comments have been so specific that I think it has to be him. Um, Interesting. Just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that unless you were him or somebody very close to him in his family that he's mm. told things to. Probably him. 
I think it probably is like him who else too. would it be in his family that would care enough to go do that? And he's egotistical enough and arrogant enough that he probably he used to joke about you know one day you'll make a movie about us. You know it's so weird. Wow. <sighs> well, I mean, he literally this all played out. Yeah, like a movie. I'm surprised. Has anyone done like has Lifetime ever tried to do like a reenactment movie type? No, thing? I mean, there's next year. Um, Peacock is doing a, a fictionalized oh, okay. like multi part series mm-hmm. based on the Doctor Death podcast. Interesting. Um, and then this docu series is coming out on this major streaming platform. So next yeah, year's a big year. That's I, exciting. That's the thing about the story. I keep feeling like it's been told so many times, but there's this, you know sort of bottomless appetite for it, I think, because it is mm-hmm. it is so insane. It is. And so crazy on so many levels. It's not yeah. just a con artist, you know. No, it's not. It's just so multi-layered and so mm-hmm. horrible. And the fact that he's still walking around. Yeah. Do you know where he is? No. And and you were you were telling us before, too, because I was asking, like, is he really this wealthy? And did he, because, re- I mean, the amount of money that he spent during the course of your relationship and, um you know, the wedding that was supposedly going to happen, that was going to be millions of dollars. And mm. you were saying that you believe that maybe he's using money from grants that he's getting potentially. I mean, his lawyer claimed in court that he's essentially broke, that he has enough money just to live, which may or may not be true. Um, money wh- was never his motive, you know, mm-hmm. unlike most mm-hmm. con artists that are after money. He was not after money for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and he spent money like crazy, you know, but... When I think back on it, you know, he was often paying with a Russian credit card, you know, and he had this very lucrative multi-million dollar grant, research grant in Russia. So for all I know, the Russian government funded our entire relationship, you know, and he was taking money that was supposed to go to research and using it to live and just, you know, and he probably was. And I think most of his flights were paid for by Karolinska as, Mm. you know, so he would definitely, definitely was using money creatively. Um, He claimed, I mean, one of the funniest texts I got from him was when I was confronting him about everything about the wedding before I fully confronted him. Um, I lost so much money on canceling the vendor and canceling the this. And I I kept pressing him because I knew he was lying. How much? At least two million. I know. (laughs) Two million? Okay. (laughs) Do you ever think about Especially, you know, from the very end where he was like, oh, yeah, I'm in Russia, but he was actually in Barcelona. Do you think that on some of those trips when he was saying he was somewhere that maybe he was somewhere else oh, or, yeah. you know, that Probably he may not time. have ever actually given you oh, yeah. exactly what he was doing or where he was? And, of course. And mm-hmm. do you think it's possible he had a someone else like you out there? That well, he, look, I mean, there are at least, well, actually four. There are at least four families. There's me and my daughter. There's the wife in Italy that he never divorced, although he now has divorced. Or I guess she divorced him. And they um, had two apparently. kids. Yes, and they have two kids. And then there's the woman in Barcelona. I don't know if he ever married her or what the deal was there mm-hmm. that he has two kids with. There's another woman who reached out to me after I went public um, who also has a child with him. Um, wow. And I know this because I saw pictures of the child. She sent me all kinds of stuff. Um, and the child was wrong right in the middle of our relationship. So that's four families right there. How many others he has, I have no idea. You know? Do you think there could be more? Oh yeah. Wow. Definitely. How does he have time for all that? That's what I that's what's so crazy to me is like, how did he fit all this in? How do you keep it straight? I don't know. Like and he never he never messed up. He never, you know, he never faltered. None none of this ever phased him. Um, you know, he had all these phones, you know, a Spanish phone, a Russian phone, a Swedish phone, you know. Um, and now I look back and I think he was probably sitting there on the Spanish phone because I don't speak any of these right, languages. Right, he can just talking to another woman right in front of me. You know, you have no idea. Yeah, but unfortunately, oh, the what he did to me and what he, you know, the lying in his romantic life is the least of it. You know, mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's what he did to his patients that's so appalling, and mm-hmm. and it's, that's the reason I can't, I just can't stop talking about, it. and I won't. You know. Mm-hmm. I think he should be behind bars, you know, and mm-hmm. I just think it's it's awful that he isn't. It is awful. If there was one thing that you could say to him if you had the chance or to ask him, is there anything or do you have anything in mind that you've thought about saying to him if you could? I used to think 
I would ask him why. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, why? But now I don't even know what the point would be because he, he, I don't know that he can answer me. I don't know mm -hmm. if he knows why. And whatever comes out of his mouth is going to be a lie. Yeah. So I just kind of have nothing to say to him now, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I felt that way at one point during the trial. I started to really get back to that, like, why? Why the hell did you do this? You know, why did you do this to me, to my daughter, to to all of us, to any of us? Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm not going to get that answer. That's that's an elusive answer that I'm never going to get. You know, and does he even have an answer for that? That would make yeah. sense to anybody else other than him. Mm -hmm. No, probably not. Because it sure seems like it was all about him anyway, and he's the only one that understands it. At maybe the he day. doesn't know why. Yeah, or maybe you he know? doesn't. It's just something he does and. He lives in this. Or maybe he believes, maybe he believes what he stood there in court and said, you know, maybe he really believes that he's the victim and that he, yeah. I don't know how he explains all the stuff with me, you know. I know initially right after the thing in Barcelona, he tried telling a colleague that that was his housewife or something. How do you know that's not a housekeeper, you know. And I remember for a second thinking, well, I guess I don't. But then I found, you know, I found out through other avenues. I even got the kids' names and everything and they're they're totally his and, you know. Um, and he acknowledged them in court. The attorney acknowledged four kids, not the other one that I know about. But wow! And how he did that, I have no idea because those kids were four and six years old at the time. Mm. And how he was, but that explains in, all these sudden emergency surgeries. You know, he was with me that Christmas. He proposed. I wanted him to stay for New Year's Eve, and all of a sudden, I can't stay. There's an emergency surgery. Well, he's rushing back probably to the family in Barcelona. He probably told her that he had an emergency surgery in the U.S., and that's why he had to be gone at Christmas. Right, Crazy. yeah. Have you heard anything about how their families are doing, the kids, yeah. nothing? I heard she left him, thank mm. goodness. Good, yeah. Yeah. I feel sorry for his kids. You yeah, know? I do too. Um, and I think that is very difficult because I'm sure they're going to want to defend him, and I'm sure they're going to want to mm -hmm. believe him. Um, yeah, and who knows what lies he's been telling them. Exactly. Or, I mean, I'm sure I heard at so one many point, things. I can't remember who told me this, but I thought this was funny. He told somebody that, well, that I'm crazy, which I knew. Of course he was. Of course I'm going to be crazy. But that I was just upset because I fell madly in love with him, and it was unreciprocated love. And um, what? All and I said, okay, so all those videos where we're, yeah. you know, and all those, what the hell is that? It's such a stupid lie, you know. It's I'm just angry because so he hurtful. didn't return my love. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's it's also just stupid. Little, yeah, I have so much videotape yeah, and yeah. texts and everything else. Well, all his lies are really stupid if right. you think about it. Um, so how's your daughter doing now? She's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I'm glad to hear that she, she's a, you know. Yeah. Obviously, I'm biased. I'm her mom, but she's a remarkable young human. And um, she's got a really good head on her shoulders. Oh, that's amazing. Angry at him, but, you know, yeah. and I think has worried a lot about me over the years. Um, I'm sure. Especially since then. But she's fine. That's good. I'm glad to hear that. And we're very close and um, very grateful for that. And how and are you doing? I'm okay. It's been hard, you know. Um, yeah, I was just uh, looking online, and I know you see it all the time too, but just on your documentary, I was kind of looking at the reviews and stuff and just like the things that people say. and Like just it's it's terrible. I mean, and people will call you everything and, you know, how could you be so stupid? This is so obvious. And it's just like. It's not at all. Nobody I, understands. That's something I wasn't prepared for. You know, I was I was so hell bent on exposing him, and so I was just laser focused on this man is dangerous, and I I have to go public, and I have to. It doesn't matter what happens to me, even though mm -hmm. my friends warned me. I was not prepared for how brutal people can be. You know, it's and it, it was awful at the beginning. You know, and I was so shocked by um, how cruel it is, mm -hmm. and. It took me a minute, you know, at the beginning, my friends were like, stop reading that stuff. We're going to come over and take your computer yeah. away. You know, we're going to tie your <laughs> yeah. hands behind your back. No. And it's taken a little while, but now I don't, I, I have yeah. such a thick skin because it's just, if you get that, way. honestly, if that's what you take away from my story, that's sad. You know, yeah. if, if victim shaming and making mm -hmm. assumptions about me and pointing the finger at, at me is what you take away from this. And I, I don't, I don't even have the time of day for you because this yeah. is not even about me. This is about a man who's killing people quite frankly mm -hmm. you know and is mm -hmm. evil and if you can't see past the rest of it um and people make snap judgments without knowing the story or you know um and people of course think this will never happen to them but you know what until you're in a situation like this you don't know that yeah these con artists are so manipulative 
And there's so much gaslighting that goes on and so much mental manipulation. We were talking earlier. It's not unlike um, what they do in cults. And that's another reason I'm so adamant about talking about this because when women get conned, you know, they feel so stupid. Mm-hmm. They feel so embarrassed and so ashamed. And that's a lot of reasons women don't talk speak up about it, mm-hmm. you know? And the problem is if we don't talk about it, this never stops, this right. perpetuates. They count on us not talking about us, mm-hmm. about it, you know? And that allows them to keep getting away f- with it. And there are good reasons sometimes that people can't talk because of kids and, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. But if we can talk about it, we need to. And yeah. we need to support each other, not yes. be pointing the finger at each other and victim shaming. And mm-hmm. that's not the point, you know? Yeah. They're not the bad guys. You know, what was what is your crime as a woman who got conned? You fell in love with somebody. That's not a crime. No. And you wanted to believe the person you fell in love with. Mm-hmm. That's not a crime either. And it doesn't make you stupid. Mm-mm. It makes you trusting. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, speaking out about this is just so vitally important in, in so many ways. But for so many other women out there who have been in a similar situation, maybe not as extreme as yours, to make them feel not so alone and that, you know. This can happen to anyone. Yes, and spread no, awareness really about it because, yeah, you really got to be on high alert with people. Watch out for these people. I think yeah. one of the most important lessons out of all of this is if you're vulnerable, you know, when I look back when I met him, I was so vulnerable, you know. Um, and if you're in a vulnerable stage in your life, it could be anything. You know, you might have just had a death in the family. It, you coming out of a a really bad relationship or a breakup or a divorce or you lost a job, anything. Mm -hmm. But if you're vulnerable, you really have to have your guard up. Um, I always say that I think these con artists have like a vulnerability radar. They kind of know exactly who they can target, you know, and you have to have your guard up because when you're vulnerable, what do you want? You want someone to wrap their arms around you and tell you that everything's going to be okay. And they prey on that not unlike any other criminal or like yeah. a serial killer they 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 know exactly who they can target and so you have to kind of be hyper vigilant yeah when you're when you're vulnerable it's yeah, a way to gain really control do. too yeah they see that power. vulnerability as a end to gain control over that person and then flip them and utilize them as a tool for what they want to do well and the other thing is don't mistake kindness for weakness and that's what they do you mm-hmm. know just because you're a kind, empathetic, caring very person true. Very true. does not mean that you're weak and you can no. be manipulated and lied to, but they think you. They think that. No, and you are very, very strong. I mean, to just Thank snap you. into action after going through such a shock, I think it's just so admirable. And then taking this in your ho- own hands for years and continuing to spread the story and being so open. And we're just so honored that you, you. flew all the way out here to spend time Thank with us. This has been me. so interesting to hear it all from you. It's really a story that has captivated me, you know, Thank since you. I heard about it. So getting to really talk to you about this has been it's amazing. Hard, you know, it is. people always call me, call me brave, which is so humbling and so nice. But and sometimes I'm like, being brave sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Totally. It does suck. <laughs> yeah. and that's um, okay to say. It's and, hard. It's hard. And it's definitely taken a toll on me. And I think some of that is just sort of hitting me now. Um, yeah. I'm so, you know, my heart is so guarded. And it's and that's tough, you know, because it's it's hard to get into a relationship again. And, to, you know, and I want yeah. that, but I'm so wary. And, um, and that makes me sad because I never wanted to give him that power. And I said that from the beginning that I, I'm a diehard romantic and I yeah. never wanted him to change that. But it's definitely affected me. Yeah, uh, you know, of course. You're hard. only human. I mean... This would affect anybody. Yeah. Um, but I think you've ha- handled it remarkably Thank well. Um, yes. Everyone, please check out Benita. You can see her documentary. You can check her out on TikTok and Instagram. She has her podcast that I talked about earlier, Benita and the Baracas. It's awesome. There are only five episodes now. So definitely give that a listen. Also, BenitaAlexander.com, Facebook, Love Con Stories with Benita Alexander. And then TikTok and, and Instagram, you can find in the link, you know, the link to all of this is Benita Alexander underscore official. Yes. Some other Benita Alexander out there. I don't know who she is, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Hate yeah. it when they take your hand. Take the official. Like, the on. worst. Yeah. The worst. Well, well they, this yeah, has thank been you such so a treat, much. really. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate this it. Was, you guys are great. Oh, oh thank you. Thank yeah, you. this is just like, I feel like I learned so much from our conversation mm-hmm. and just... I like I really was like listening to you trying to like put myself 
in your shoes and like really start. And I think that's what everybody out there needs to do is like stop judging this from your own yeah. bias maybe and actually like try to put yourself in in your shoes and think about how it'd feel. And like when you start hearing, especially because it's so hard because all the things that come out on the media aren't specific enough, that aren't enough no it's evidence snippets of yeah it's such mm-hmm. snippets and so people just take those snippets and they think that's all there is but mm-hmm. until you really dive into it and you start I, like hearing you talk about all the things that he would tell you and and i started feeling myself like falling for him in a weird way like yeah, that sounds too. weird but just kind of like, like getting wrapped up in the fantasy and like yeah. his face yeah. is in my head and i'm just thinking like i would probably probably fall for him too oh i, would, I know i would like all my the, all my friends that male and you know Straight, just gay, like he, male, female, they all said that, you know? Like, yeah. ha, like he is just, and that's just what's so scary and so dangerous about him is it's the so fact charming. that he is just so charming. And so he's just got it all together. And it, But it, now it sounds like he's starting to maybe fall apart. And it, I think so. Hopefully it's yeah. it's starting to crumble and it will lead to him stopping what he's yeah. doing, hopefully. I think even if he hasn't been fully held accountable and he's not behind bars, this Apollo's is the worst nightmare mm-hmm. was that his reputation would be tanked. Right. That's so true. And he'd have this fall from grace. And that has happened. You know? Yeah. And, and so now in it's... a way, this is his worst nightmare. And it yeah. is the worst thing that could happen to him. Oh, sh- You can't Google sure. him now. The right. first, you know, without finding yep. all of this out, his reputation is completely shattered and scathed mm-hmm. and And that tarnished. was everything to him. Now yeah. it's gone. And it's all gone. So, yeah, that's you got to take that as a win, I think. Yeah, that, I think at so. the very least his, you know, that super, you know, God complex of his has got to be, you know, and I also starting don't to crack think he ever. I can pretty much guarantee you he never in a million years imagined I'd be doing what I'm doing. I mean, he thought he had me, he mm-hmm. thought he had me in his pocket. And even when I found everything out, I think he thought I was so hurt and so broken yeah. that I was just going to kind of slink away. You know, fade into mm-hmm. the yeah. shadows. Yeah. And I don't think, I think he's probably in shock, you know. And I'm the sure. fact that I keep talking about it, he's probably like, when is she going to shut yeah, up? Yeah, <laughs> he's like, damn, You're not thought she'd go away. But yeah, mm. no, good for you. I mean, yeah, keep it up. We're here to support. Thank we're you. we're going to, we're going to follow you and, and follow this because, yeah, I want, mm-hmm. I want to see where this goes. And hopefully, yeah. fingers crossed, there's some accountability. More. for him yeah. i hope comes. so yeah. i hope there'll be justice for his patients yeah. really or or yeah. karma will get him eventually oh karma you know? will get him. so yeah. karma's yeah. already coming back in around. the works yeah, yeah exactly yeah. but thank you so much for joining us thank you we're gonna wrap up today's episode there yes leave us any comments and feedback below we'd love to hear from you guys as always and thank you for joining us we'll be back next week um, but until then keep on taking your mind a mile higher 